So welcome everybody <coughs> for the second <coughs> second uh, day in our course on early Buddhist meditation. Uh, and today the theme is the historical context. Who was the Buddha speaking to? So we're going to consider the nature of pre-Buddhist contemplative practices. We're going to consider uh, ancient, some ancient texts of the Brahmins and the Jains, and we're going to emphasize that when reading these, we need to do so with empathy. Uh, and as Buddhists, then uh, it's easy to read other things with the eye of saying what's wrong with them, but that's kind of boring. So if you want to have a fun life, don't go through life finding out what's wrong with everything. Find out what's right with things. It's much more interesting. And even things that you disagree with. If you find something that's right in something that you disagree with, then you've learned something. If you find something wrong with something you disagree with, then you're just reinforcing what you already believed, and that's boring. So I'm going to try to find something good to say about these ancient scriptures. Uh, now, <clears throat> before we... So the, one of the purposes here is that we want to understand the Buddha's teachings in a historical context. Now, this is implicit in the very idea of early Buddhism, okay? So early means time, and it means that this is, that the Buddha was speaking in a time and a place to people who were there. And if we don't understand who those people were, if we don't understand what mattered to them, what their values were, then we will misunderstand what the Buddha was saying because we will inevitably impose our own values and concerns on those texts. And we find people doing that all the time these days. We read the Buddha's text as if the Buddha was speaking to me and what mattered to me. Okay, rule number one, nobody cares. Nobody cares about you or what your feelings were or anything like that. Well, the Buddha didn't care because the Buddha's dead. He's not here. He wasn't talking to you. Yeah? So get over yourself. These texts are not about you, right? They're about the person that the Buddha was talking to. And if you make everything about yourself, this is just ego. It's just narcissism. And it's a lack of empathy. So when we read sacred scriptures, we read it through compassion. We read it through empathy. We ask ourselves, what, what were these people's concerns? What was their worries? What, what, why did this matter to them? Yeah? And what we might find, I'm not going to say we will find, okay? Because I don't, want to, I don't want to tell you what's right and what's wrong. But what you might find is that what matters to them also matters to you. Yeah? <laughs> it's possible, okay? So we'll just leave that as an open-ended hypothesis for now. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Ling and Tom, for coming late. It's most appreciated. You, 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 have, you have sent the message to everybody else that they can relax and don't have to be worried about being on time. So I know that, I know that, that was that's a very beautiful choice that you've made there, so thank you. <laughs> it's a choice I do often, uh, out, purely out of compassion. Uh, anyway, moving on. <coughs> Okay, moving on. Now, there was some uh, talk uh, yesterday. We just mentioned uh, about uh, doing uh, a, a quick review of Pali pronunciation for the chanting. Would you like to do that just before we begin? Just to do a little review of Pali, Pali pronunciation? Okay, good. Why not? All right, so Wikipedia has pretty good resources on Pali, actually. Most of the Buddhist stuff on Wikipedia is not very good, but the Pali stuff is usually pretty good, actually. So I recommend checking Wikipedia if you have any questions. Uh, there's a good article about Pali, elements of grammar and so on, which we won't go into. But let's just briefly look at the pronunciation. Now this is, uh, uh, this is a useful chart. Okay, let me see exactly what we've got on that chart, okay. <laughs> Where's our, oh, okay. Uh, so just blowing it up so we can have, see it a good size. Is that good size? Yeah, that's good size. All right, so here, 
good old Wikipedia. So the table says that they're using the Thai script, but there's no Thai script there. So someone edited it and forgot to, forgot to change that bit. Anyway, so what this is is a table of the consonant pronunciations. Actually, maybe we go to the vowels first. Do we have vowels? Okay, let's start with the vowels. It's easier. So let's start with the table of the vowel pronunciations in Pali. Right? So here are the vowels. Now, in the, the blue is the uh, International Phonetic Alphabet uh, representation of these sounds. And, sorry, just blew that up. Uh, where am I? Okay. Can everybody read? Yeah? Okay. So the blue is the International Phonetic uh, Alphabet. And the, uh, the, in the angled brackets is the uh, romanized uh, pronunciation. So I'll go into that um, a bit more just in a little bit. But for now, this is the romanized pronunciation, which is how usually uh, international scholars will represent uh, Pali. Now, so you can see, first of all, this teaches us one thing, which is that the, um, the, each of the letters in Pali has a well-defined pronunciation, okay? And they're represented in the International Phonetic Alphabet. And as I mentioned briefly yesterday, that pronunciation is not arbitrary, it's not something that people have just made up, it's something which is described in a very explicit and careful detail in the Pali texts themselves. So there are commentaries and linguistic analyses in the Pali texts which build on the linguistic analyses in the Sanskrit texts and they define things like the position of, so here it has the backness, right, where it is, where this is pronounced in the mouth. So all of this is actually described in the Pali text. It will tell you where to put the tongue, what, you know, how, how, it's, how it's voiced and so on. So none of this is a kind of, this is just a modern presentation, but none of this is, is a kind of modern uh, ideas. And so this is how we know what Pali is supposed to be pronounced like. Okay, so uh, in Pali, all of the vowels are simple vowels. There are basically no diphthongs, okay? It says diphthongs there, it's not quite right. But anyway, diphthongs is where you glide one vowel into another, okay? So in English, we usually diphthongalize all of our long vowels, or very commonly we do. So we say something like boat, bow, bow. Uh, and you can see that there's a glide in the sound there from bow. Yeah? Or I might say, um, what's another word with a long vowel? Uh, feed, 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 eat. And we're gliding that sound. So in Pali, we don't do that at all. Each, and that's an unusual characteristic of English. So this is a characteristic of English speakers who speak Pali, then they tend to diphthongalize their vowels. Because speakers who have non-English speaking backgrounds, usually this is not a problem. So in Pali, all the vowels are simple vowels. So that means that your mouth doesn't move while you're sounding the vowel. E, e, u, u, e, a, o, a. Huh? Again, e, 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 e. You sound like little monkeys now. U, u. <laughs> also like monkeys. Ooh, ooh, right? Ooh, ooh, eh, eh, ah, oh, ah. Okay? So um, we mentioned yesterday when we were talking that, generally speaking, the Sinhala pronunciation is uh, very good. Uh, but one uh, area where the Sinhalese pronunciation differs from Pali is the pronunciation of the short ah. So in Sinhalese, you'll hear it's very common to weaken the ah. Okay, so this is like an evolved sound. So you'll hear like namo tasa, and the ah is kind of gone to an uh. Yeah? So that's not a feature of Pali. So in Pali, it's just ah. Namo tasa, yeah. Um, so there's a few kind of small, always small things like that, but that's just like a regional accent, right? Ah. This one, ah. Uh, so you see that uh, with the I, U, and A, the short vowel has uh, no macron, no diacritical mark, and the long vowel has a stroke above, which we call a macron, okay? The E and the O are always long, so that's why they don't take a macron, okay? So E and O are always long. 
Now, sometimes in practice, they are abbreviated because they come before a double consonant, okay? But you can still tell that from the fact that it has a double consonant. But if it's just the air by itself or the o by itself, it's always long. Uh, oh, and also, in theory, at least, um, the, the length is half, right? So a short vowel is half the length of a long vowel. Uh, and that's why when we, can, we do chanting, then technically the, the each two, two short consonants is equivalent to one long consonant. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo. So it's like that. In practice, of course, as a living language, it would not really be like that, right? People are, a bit more, are much more flexible with things. But technically, uh, that's how that works. All right? So any questions about the vowels? Good. Okay, let's look at the consonants. So for the consonants, we have a nice little table here. Now, I'll tell you that one thing about uh, Indian uh, scholars, they love systems, okay? They love categorizing things, organizing things, and making charts and tables and stuff like that. So that's really helpful because it means that we can actually have a meaningful table for the presentation of all of the Indic alphabets. And this applies not just to Pali, but also to Sanskrit and all modern uh, languages derived from the same kind of base. And you can see rather than the arbitrary alphabetical order that you have in English, right? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, just it's made up. In, uh, in Indic languages, the alphabetical order is based on the position of enunciation of the sound in your mouth. So you begin with the back of the mouth, which is the, the glottal, ha. And then we come here to the vela, mm, ka, 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 ga. This is pronounced at the back of the mouth, yeah? Okay, and at each point of articulation, so there's five main points of articulation, and at each point of articulation, there are five main sounds. So ignore these, these extra ones for now, and just look at this main block. Yeah? So you have each, each of these is a point of articulation in the mouth. And each of these are the five different sounds you can make at that point of articulation. All right? Uh, so this is the back of the mouth. Ga. This is the uh, roof of the mouth, the tongue at the roof of the mouth. Nya, cha, 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 ja. This is the retroflex with the tongue curled back so that the, the back of the tip of the tongue is resting on the bridge of the mouth. Na, ta, ta, da, da. And this is the dental with the tongue at the base of the teeth. Na, ta, ta, da, da. And this is the labial at the lips. Ma, ba, pa, ba, ba. Okay? So you can read it either coming from the lips to the back of the mouth or the other way around. And so this is how uh, systematic that everything is arranged in. Um, uh, in Indic languages, and today, even if you're learning, I know in learning Thai, they probably got an equivalent in, Pal in Sinhala, but if you're a school child and you're learning the alphabets in Thai, you start with Gorgai. Gorgai meaning Gore is the name of the letter. Gai is a chicken. Gorgai, go chicken, Ko Kai, Ko egg, and so on. And so that's how you learn your alphabet. And you learn it through those places of articulation. All right, so let's just look at one of those places of articulation here, the vela. Uh, so we'll leave off the sonorant here, or the nasal, and just look at these ones. These are the plosive or hard consonants, otherwise known as stops. And they go, welcome, venerables. Thank you so much for coming. No, no, thank you. That's very compassionate of you. You're reminding us that it's never too late to practice the Dhamma. All right, so here the, um, these are, th so these, this, these four are always pronounced with a hard sound, uh, and you have a pattern where you have unvoiced, unaspirated, unaspirated but voiced, voiced and unaspirated, and voiced and aspirated. Yeah, so that same pattern applies throughout. Again, very, very systematic. So the voice is the, uh, the uh, rumble of your vocal cords when you're pronouncing a letter. 
the aspiration is the puff of air that accompanies a letter. So the first one, K, has neither voiced nor aspirated. Ga. Ga. Sounds like a crow, right? That's in fact the word for crow in Pali. Ga. See, now you learn some Pali. Gaka is, is crow. Ga. Can you say that? Ga. So in, in English, most of you are used to pronouncing English. In English, you don't really have that sound very much, okay? Uh, usually in English, we aspirate all of our hard consonants, okay? So normally if you say ka in English, it has, you can feel, put your hand in front of your mouth, ka, ka, yeah? You can feel the English, the, the, you feel the English, feel, <laughs> feel the, the puff of air coming out, ka, 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 right? Now that's actually the second letter here, K-H, okay? So when we say ka, it's that second letter, ka, but you can exaggerate it a bit more in Pali, all right? Ka, you don't have to, but ka, ka. So how do you learn to pronounce it without the aspiration? Well, the trick is that in English, we don't aspirate those hard consonants when they come after an S. You already do this, you just didn't realize it. So try saying to yourself, ska, 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 feel? No puff of air, it's gone, ska, ska. So that K is that first one, yeah? ga. So ka, ka, ga, ga. So learn to say ska and then just drop the S off. Ska, ska, ga, 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 ga. Yeah? Can you feel the difference? Ska, ka. <laughs> can, can you feel the difference? Yeah? Okay, so this is the first two letters. And then the second one, we now have the voiced, okay? So the G is the same as the ordinary G in English. Okay, so ga. And then, but this one here is one that we don't normally have in English. So this is a, a, normally, normally in English, uh, the hard consonants are either aspirated or voiced. So we effectively have two on each of those, okay? On one stop, where Pali have four letters, we have two, usually. But as we've seen, sometimes we actually do have that one. Uh, and this the second one, is the, the last one is the voiced and aspirated, ga, ga. So see if you can say a G, ga, 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 and then add an H after it, ga, ga, ga. And exaggerate it to make ga. Now in fact, in fact, we do have this sound in English, but not in individual words. We have the sound when we combine words, okay? So if you can say big house, big house, big house, big house, big house, gauss, 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 yeah, gauss. So this is that ga sound in Pali. So uh, now everyone say with me, ga, ka. Ka ka. Ga ga. Ga ga. Very good. Easy, right? And so this uh, top one is the uh, nasal, which is the pure nasal. Like, mm, mm, mm. So that one's easy. So that one very commonly comes at the end of, of words. So tip, a lot of words in Pali will end with the, uh, they call it anaswara, is the, the final, the closing sound. Although when it's, it's kind of a technical thing, but you know the M with a dot above it? Uh, technically in Pali, that's not considered to be a consonant, which is why it's not on this um, chart. But the N with a dot on it is actually the same sound, all right? But here, it's spelt with an N with a dot on it when it appears before one of the other consonants. This is actually just a convention, and it's not actually observed consistently in Pali manuscripts. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So, so sometimes you'll see that when they write Pali, say a word like Sangha, okay? So sometimes the Sangha will be S-A-N dot G-H-A, yeah? So they've used this one. But you can also spell Sangha S-A-M dot G-H-A, yeah? So it's actually the same sound, and the manuscripts will vary. But m m this way is doing it is a bit more technically correct in that sense, okay? But it doesn't really affect how you pronounce it. All right, so now let's go from the... Uh, the vela to the palatal. Uh, ja, cha, ja, ja. Exactly the same process here. Cha, 
Same thing in English, we usually have this one and this one. Yeah? Not C is never C, 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 C or nor is it um, uh, hard C as in car, but is always cha, yeah? like the Italian cha. Uh, so cha, cha. Again, you see the difference in the, in the air. Cha, cha, cha. Cha, but no voicing. Ja, cha. And then we add the voicing in. Ja, 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 ja. Okay? Uh, ja. All right? Um, ja, ja, ja. Okay, very good. And now the next one. And oh, and the, the nasal is nya, as in senor. Okay, so nya. A common word as in jnana and many other words. Retroflex. So retroflex is a slightly unusual um, position to articulate consonants and we don't find the retroflex, again, sort of conventionally we don't find it in English, although in certain English accents you do find something that approximates to the retroflex. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the history of the retroflex, but I suspect that it may have been influenced by Munda or maybe, maybe Dravidian languages. I think in Tamil they maybe have these retroflex or maybe in the older Dravidian languages, I can't recall now. Anyway, so these are basically pronounced with the concula against the lack of mouth like this. Okay? Da, ta, da, da. Da, ta, da. Da, da, ta, da, da. Yeah. And so you can hear this is a very kind of characteristic, quite Indian sound. You know, you hear a word like munda, yeah, or uh, danda. Yeah, it has that kind of sound, which is very, you know, you know you, it sounds quite Indian and it's, it's an unusual sound. Most world languages, you don't really find that danda. So you, most people, when they're pronouncing Pali, will typically ignore that retroflex which is usually just the dot underneath the consonant, right? Uh, and they'll just pronounce it the same as the dental. But you won't do that, will you? No. No, you will not. You will do it correctly. And you will not care if it makes, it sound, makes you sound silly. You don't worry about that. You only care about pronouncing it correctly. All right, so this is, yeah, so this is, these are the, the diacritical ones that are spelt with the dot underneath them. Um, so a word like satipatthana, with a th, or um, yeah, quite a common. Uh, tanha uses this one. Na nha tanha, tanha, tanha. Okay, then the dental pronounced at the with the tongue at the base of the teeth. Ta uh, ta da da, and the same deal as with the other ones. In English, we usually have the th sound ta and the D, da, but we don't have that or that. But again, the same thing applies. Uh, for example, you say the word uh, till, 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 and you can feel the, 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 the aspiration, till, and now say still, 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 still. Yeah? So that T is this one, the unaspirated one. Till, D, okay, ta, da, da. Da, ta, da, da. Yeah. Buddha. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the N is the ordinary N, and here the M, uh, ma, ba, pa, ba, ba. Same thing. Normally in English, pa and ba. But ba, pa, ba, ba. Again, we can do the same trick for this one. Uh, pin, 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 pin. Spin, 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 spin. You see, you never knew you were doing unaspirated consonants this whole time. It's weird, isn't it? It's, language is so funny. You learn these little details and you never think about it. It's so odd. Uh, anyway, so this is, that, this is that system of consonants. And so that's actually a really nice system, makes it really easy to learn and remember, and it follows the alphabetical order. So if you're looking up a Pali dictionary, then it will always follow that same alphabetical order, k, k, ka, ka, ga, ga, and so on and so forth. Now, in addition to those major um, 
uh, um, uh, major consonants, then we have a bunch of um, uh, miscellaneous, uh, the fricative, which is the ordinary S, unvoiced S. Uh, Sanskrit is a bit different. In Sanskrit, you have three S's, sh, uh, s, and sh, and here you only have one. Uh, like in, in Mandarin, also, you have a few different S sounds, but here only the ordinary uh, unvoiced unaspirated sibilant, H, again, ha, ordinary H. It's worth noting that uh, in the romanization of Pali, the letter H is the only sign that is ambiguous, right? Uh, because it's used here as a sign of aspiration, and it's used here as an independent letter. All right. So actually, in the Indic languages, in, if you're writing in Sinhala or Thai or Devanagari or uh, anything else, then these are just one letter. Okay? It's only the Roman convention that makes these two letters, uh, the Romanization convention. So you can see, sometimes they actually will represent them like they have with the phonetic alphabet there. So the H just indicates uh, an aspiration there. So it's not actually two letters, it's one letter. Uh, and that indicates aspiration. So, but this H here is an independent letter, a voiceless glottal fricative. Uh, then we have approximately ha. ha, 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 ha. Anyway, okay. Uh, okay, so then these ones here, this is a V, uh, sort of somewhat in between a V and a W sound. That's probably more dialectical than anything. R is the rolled R. Rahula. Yeah. Rahula. Raho. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps not rolled quite that much, okay? I'm just exaggerating so you know what I mean. And here is the ya, uh, ordinary y. So y is always a consonant in Pali. We don't have the vowel y, always a consonant. The l, again, ordinary l. This one is a retroflex l, uh, pronounced with the tongue curled back against the roof of the mouth. As in pagalha, mulha, mulha. Yes. Uh, that's actually the aspirated version, mulha. Yeah, this one. So it's the um, thing. So this is uh, this is the Thai consonants. Sorry, not the Thai consonants. The Pali consonants in the Romanized form, and uh, we've seen the vowels and we've seen the consonants. So the vowels up here. Then we where are we now? We've lost it. So remember the vowels: e, e, u, u, e, a, a. Oh, okay, uh, and the consonants, and then in, in addition, we also have the anuswara, or the nigahita, which is represented by the M with a dot above it, or the M with a dot below it, depending on the Romanized system. That's the only major difference in the Romanization systems for Pali. Sometimes the M is spelt with a dot above, sometimes it's spelt with a dot below. Uh, but it has, it's the same meaning, it's just uh, different conventions. Uh, so... Uh, kata, that this the, the anuswara is usually, uh, literally the word anuswara means the following sound. Yesterday we learned that anu means following or after. Anuswara, the following sound. So it's literally the sound that closes the uh, word. So you find this very commonly in Pali. Uh, briefly, uh, just to look at the um, uh, internationalization systems. Uh, the sort of original form of internationalization is known as the IAST, International Alphabet of Sanskrit Transliteration. And this was developed by international Sanskrit scholars uh, around uh, 1894 in Geneva. And it's the main one that's been used in uh, Pali studies since then. Uh, and most of these ones you'll be familiar. It's used to support Sanskrit, so it has a few sounds here that we don't have in Pali as well. Um, so here you can see this in the Romanized as well as the Devanagari forms. Uh, in addition to this system, we have the uh, ISO system, which is what we use on Sutta Central. Uh, and the ISO system is the, uh, uh, 
basically the ISO system is a more, it's, it's for Pali it's exactly the same except for the M with the M dot above or below. That's the only difference for Pali. But the reason why that change was made uh, is because um, it allows it to be uh, systematized so that it can apply to a greater range of languages. So the IAST, the older one, will only work for Pali and Sanskrit, whereas this new system is designed to work with a whole range of Indic languages as well. So that's why they made uh, that one change. Uh, and you can see the chart here. So there's quite a nice little chart here on Wikipedia, uh, which gives the forms of these words. Let's go down to some of these consonants we were looking at before. So here's our, here's our ga and ka. And you can see here in the different scripts, some of which this is the Romanized version, and Devanagari, and so on. Let's see the names of them up here. Nast Nastalik, I don't know what that is. What's Nastalik? Okay, so this is Arabic, so you can write it in Arabic as well. Bengali, yes. Gurmukhi, Gujarati, Odia, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayam, and Sinhala. So, ah, uh, ah, uh, and so on. So this is the uh, ISO uh, standard. Uh, and so this will support a wide range of Indian, Indian languages. And so this is why, as we pointed out yesterday, that on sort of central we can actually mechanically change from one language to another uh, because all of these are defined in the Unicode standard. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Uh, I think, um, let me go back here. Where are we? Oops. I think the J was the phonetic form. Thinking, uh, where are we? Uh, you're thinking here? Yeah? Yeah, so that there the J is the phonetic alphabet form, which is ya. Yeah, the, 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 the way we spell it is with a Y, but that's just the convention for the international voiced palliative approximant, or yod. What I'm saying is that that's, ignore that J. Yeah, unless you know the international phonetic alphabet. Yeah, so in the way that we, we spell it, it's, it's a Y, and it's pronounced ya. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Madhu. Sure. Uh, from the back to the front. Nga, nya, na, na, ma. Do it again. Nga, nya, na, na, ma. You don't look persuaded. <laughs> Some examples. Uh, okay, so this one. Um, so these, these, these will always, okay, so in Pali, words will always end with either a vowel or the anuswara. So they either end with the vowel or the anuswara, the, the ung sound at the end. So these only occur inside words. They never occur at the end of words. That's in Pali, other languages they do. So the, the vela here will occur inside words, usually preceding one of these other consonants. So a word like sangha, yeah, sangha or gang ka, that's gang mm, ka, gang ka, yeah? So a a actually, th actually the sound of these is very natural. You don't even have to worry about it. If you pronounce a, 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 a liquid sound before the vowel, sorry, before the consonant, it will just naturally be that sound. That's all it is. It's really just representing what, what it would naturally be, which is why they sometimes don't bother writing it. Yeah, so the same thing here. So this is before the cha. So, uh, ancha, anenja, 
Yeah? Anenja. Uh, what other ones are there? Chart sounds. Uh, in cha. Anyway, that's good enough. A couple of examples. Retroflex. Uh, danda. Danda. Uh, this one would be dental is danta, danta, which means tooth, <laughs> danta, yes. Twa, yes. That's a, that's a, that's a consonant cluster, yeah, so, so twa. T T V, yeah. Sometimes uh, it's pronounced they put they put a vowel in between it. So in Thai pronunciation they'll usually put a vowel between them, so it'd be tava. So 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 where Pali is katwa, they would say katawa. Uh, but actually in that case there's no inherent vowel. So it's dwa. Yeah. Okay. Are we good? So this is just the basic pronunciation of the uh, letters. Uh, we can go into more detail in the pronunciation of consonant clusters and so on if we want to, but maybe that's enough for this morning. What do you think? Okay, so if you want more, we can always do more. All right. Very good. Okay, so uh, let me just speak for minute. I'm going to turn this off because it's annoying. <coughs> okay, so um, once again, when we're thinking about early Buddhist meditation, we want to know what the Buddha was saying. The Buddha was speaking language, and what we've been looking at now is a language. Language something that just exists something it's something that human beings make and they make it for a purpose okay language serves a purpose yeah and what is the original serv purpose of a language right why did human beings invent language oh this is supposed to be off what's it doing you're not supposed to be looking at that go away okay <laughs> for some reason that turns on when this when I close this so I'm trying to do this okay so language serves a purpose. What is the original purpose of language? Well, perhaps the original purpose of language was, oh my God, oh my God, it's a saber-toothed tiger. It's about to eat us. I can't prove that, but that seems likely, right? Ah, no, run away. <laughs> uh, so we want to communicate something. We want to communicate something that's meaningful to each other. Yeah? And so we develop language. Now, as we've seen through Pali, just a little bit of a glimpse that the, the, the way that language had been developed at the time of the Buddha was already very sophisticated. And that means that there had been a highly sophisticated uh, culture for a long time before the Buddha. And in fact, this is one of the, traditionally regarded as one of the uh, conditions for the appearance of the Buddha. Right? The Buddha can only appear when the culture has reached a certain stage of development. So, uh, I'm going to talk a bit this morning about what that culture was like and what it was not like and about what are the kinds of things that we can uh, expect that the Buddha was encountering as wandering across the world. And we're going to particularly look at that in the context of meditation. Now, if, I'm, if we're going to look back and say, well, if the Buddha, was the Buddha the first person to meditate? No, he was not. People were meditating before the Buddha, okay? And why were they meditating? What was the origins of meditation? Okay? Origins of meditation lost in the, midst, in the mists of time. We do not know those people. We do not know what they wanted. We don't know why they were meditating. But I'm going to make a guess anyway. And I'm going to make a guess. The reason why meditation was invented? Drugs. Yes. If there's one thing that brings people together, they want to get high. And I think that that's why people invented meditation. If we look in the oldest Indian scriptures, the Rig Veda, then they are full of drugs. Those guys were high all the time. In fact, they even made a god out of their drugs. They called them Soma. 
and there are lots of very enthusiastic hymns to their god Soma, who they loved very much. <laughs> and they were getting high all the time. And uh, now, what, what kind of drug was Soma? Hmm. Not an easy question to answer. Maybe it wasn't just one. Like maybe there was a range of substances that they used. Yeah? Different people have proposed different kinds of things. It's very popular these days to propose that Soma was the fly agaric mushroom, and it's a kind of psychedelic, mind-altering trip. But I think that that's more, more um, projection than anything else. I think most likely, uh, the most likely candidate for Soma was ephedra, which is a kind of plant which grows in the uh, Central Asian and Persian region, which is essentially a stimulant. It's like a kind of meth. Uh, it's related to, it, it has a, com, com, a chemical in it that's related to methamphetamines. So it would give you like a, well, a bit like a strong cup of coffee, really, but maybe a bit, strong, <laughs> maybe a bit stronger than that. And so they were taking this thing. Now, when we read about this, we read about it in a, in a religious scripture, right, in the Vedas. But the, the, the Vedas aren't necessarily the kind of religious scripture that we might think they are, right? I mean, we don't find a lot of philosophy in there, right? We don't find a lot of sort of reflective takes on life and the meaning of life and this kind of thing. What we do find is a lot of may Indra and Soma fill me with their power so that I can get up and go and smite my enemy. Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of stuff, yeah? And Indra, the one of the main gods there, was very much a war god. And his, his, his goal was to go and slay the dragon. Vritra, yeah, slay the dragon. And so it was, they're a very warlike hymn. And one of the roles of the Soma was not to go tripping and to have a good time and see world expanding. No, 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 no. It was to be filled with fire and fury and energy and strength and leap into battle and crush your enemies. Yeah? So in other words, the ancient Indo-Europeans were taking speed to win their wars. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why they spread out across the world. We already talked about yesterday about the mastery of the horse and the chariot as being one reason, and I think the fact that they were high all the time on speed was probably another reason. Okay, let's go, let's go make a raid. So they came down to India. Yeah? No, there's no ephedra. All comes crashing down, okay? And so you have all of these hymns lamenting the death of Soma. Yeah? Soma is gone. He's left us. Where has our God left us? Yeah? So they were all in India doing cold turkey. And <laughs> where is our God? Where is our high? Yeah? Now, I'm presenting it, obviously, in a very kind of simplistic way, right? But it's obviously it's a much more complicated thing than this. And there obviously are many reasons that come behind something like meditation. But I do believe that this was one of them. So if you look in how um, like animistic religions work, usually people will use a combination of things in order to reach some state of altered consciousness where they commune with their god or their spirits or their magical power. Drugs is one. Um, ritual is another. Maybe some kind of uh, dancing or trance. Yeah? Maybe going to a, a place of power is another one. Uh, having some kind of initiation process might be another. Doing these kinds of self-torment things is another. So that all of these kinds of things that people are doing to somehow alter their mind and their consciousness. Yeah? And these are all kind of part of that culture in the time of the Buddha, kind of leading up to that and sort of gradually evolving to a sense of where what we would recognize today as meditation. Um, and, and, you know, of course, you still find a lot of these things in India today, right? I mean, these things are not disappeared. A lot of these self-torment people, you know, a lot of the sort of rishis and so on who are taking drugs and so on, a lot of, uh, like, these agora ascetics who do the mo really kind of, uh, kind of obscene and very, very kind of vile uh, practices and, uh, and many of these different kinds of things that people do. So they're still, they're, they're just layers. They don't get left behind. They get built on top of, or at least in India, that's what happened. So, now, over time, of course, people begin to realize that these things maybe aren't as good as they thought they were, 
right? And, you know, it actually is still, you know, it's still the case. Still a lot of people come to Buddhism after, you know, trying out different things, maybe trying drugs or trying these things, and then they're actually not what they thought they were, and then they end up, maybe I'll try some meditation instead. So that road is still very well trodden today. So among the, uh, the Brahmins, uh, the, the, the kind of the old days of the sort of ecstatic and warlike uh, invocation of the Vedas uh, had been left behind. Now in terms of the, the, I'm talking now about the prehistory of India. And everything we know about the prehistory of India is somewhat speculative. So I'm just going to give you a very brief background uh, with a main focus on this. Now, what we do know is that there was a civilization uh, long before the Buddha, usually called the Indus Valley Civilization, and the Indus Valley Civilization left behind it uh, a, a vast network of cities, and all across India up to Pakistan and down as far as the Ganges Plain, there are these cities from the Indus Valley Civilization, and they date maybe two or 3,000 BC, yeah, from about 3,000 BC to about, I think, 1,500 BC is the latest ones. And these cities are quite extraordinary because they have town planning, which is not something you see very often in India today. They had well-functioning sewage systems, also, a lost art, it would seem. Uh, and they have the same kind of pattern right across that whole area, right? So clearly it was the same civilization that was building these cities across this whole area. Uh, and there are a number of curious features to the Indus Valley um, uh, architecture. One curious feature is that there's no real prominent uh, uh, monumental architecture. Right? You don't have like huge temples or even like palaces or these kinds of things. It mostly seems to be houses for people built out of solid brick. It's curious, right? You don't, you know, and often when you do excavations, you might find like, you know, we saw in the north of uh, Sri Lanka, what you find is the religious monument. That's what people really build solidly. Or you find the castle. But here it's just houses. It's interesting. Uh, you know, they have things like gran granaries and things like that. Uh, now, we don't know who those people were. Uh, we don't know what language they spoke. We don't know what gods they worshipped. We do have what they call the Indus Valley Seals. Maybe I can pull them up on, um, on Wikipedia. Uh, Indus Valley Seals. Uh, and... Okay, so let me just get this back. We have the Indus Valley Seals, and they are our main record of um, uh, like understanding like the symbols that these people uh, used. Right. Uh, so, and there's, there's quite a few. I think there's a couple of thousand of these things. They're only about this big. Right? They're like a, the size of a postage stamp. Uh, and you can see uh, many of them have, uh, here we have a unicorn. It's a bit hard to identify this one. It's a very common one. Single horned bull, unicorn, rhinoceros. But the horn is much bigger than an Indian rhinoceros. Anyway, here's another selection here. Uh, you can see sometimes animals depicted very commonly, uh, elephant, and also some symbolic things. The swastika is already there. Right? So the swastika is very old. Uh, we have elephants. <laughs> so they liked elephants. And we have uh, this weird thing. What is that? I, I, that's weird, right? Uh, bulls? Okay. This one? Yeah, I'm coming to that one in a second. 
So this is another bull, very impressive, right? All right, uh, so uh, animals, and, and they have these kind of, uh, so this one looks like a rhinoceros. So they have these um, symbols here, and they kind of look like writing. And uh, there have been many, many attempts by scholars to try to decipher this writing, and basically we haven't deciphered it yet. And it's quite likely that we never will, unfortunately, uh, because there's just, there's quite a lot of it, but it's all these very, very short statements. We have very few, long, long, the longest text is about like 100 words. Some people even argue that it's not really writing. It might be just like a symbolic system. That's not real writing. Uh, so anyway, so this is something that we know about the Indus Valley. Now, one of the things that you can see here, which is quite common, uh, you can see the, um, the animal and then this, this curious little thing here below the animal. Yeah? It's like a, almost like a stand with almost a bowl and this kind of colander or something above it. And here's a similar thing with the rhinoceros. It's like a basket below it like that. Not entirely sure what that is, but it may be evidence of uh, animal sacrifice that these were bowls there to collect the blood of the animal when it was sacrificed. But just speculation, here's another one. I mean, clearly it's a common motif, right? That, uh, you know, is, we're finding the same thing again and again. Uh, and uh, uh, here it is. So clearly it's something very significant about this. You know, again, once again, a receptacle underneath the animal's head. All right, uh, so now we can come to some of the uh, human figures, which are quite interesting here. Um, this one's kind of interesting. There's a tiger, and it looks like a man or deity or something in a tree. It's kind of weird. All right. Um, this one. This one is one of my favourites. Uh, seeing if we've got a better quality image. Oh, this one is interesting also. Um, so two, looks like unicorns next coming out of a thing. You can see that. And Bodhi leaves. Yeah? So the Bodhi leaves are quite common in the thing. So they clearly the Bodhi tree was already a sacred tree back as far as the Indic, as the uh, Indus Valley Civilization. Um, going on... I'm looking for one specific image here. Ah, uh, here we go. All right, so this is a very cool image. So this is a, who is it? Uh, ignore, the, ignore all those things. None of these are real. These are just things. The, the Indus Valley seals have unfortunately been appropriated by Hindu, Hindutva scholars and they are full of all of these things, trying to interpret them in terms of Hinduism and so on. But none of these have any credibility, so just ignore them. Um, but here is a someone strangling two tigers. That's pretty impressive, right? I mean, even to strangle one tiger is usually difficult enough, right? But to do two... <laughs> To do two, so uh, whoever that was, I think that might, I think I think that might be a goddess actually, but I'm not sure about that. I have to look it up. Um, so all these are kind of being studied by scholars. So obviously one of the most interesting ones is the this one, looks like a meditator, right? So sitting in meditation posture, um, and we find a few like this uh, often claimed or said to be a proto-Shiva, but there's no real evidence for that. Curious the kind of the bangles on his arms, yeah? And we know from uh, other Indus Valley relics that there's a very, very charming um, image, like a bronze image. One of the few things, apart from the seals we have from the Indus Valley civilization, of a dancing girl, and she has bangles on her arms, yeah? So another very ancient thing, Indian women like bangles on their arms. Yeah? And so maybe that's what these are. Uh, here's another one of a meditator uh, with a horned headdress. Me well, med well, I'm saying meditator, but somebody sitting in that meditation posture. 
So whether it's a meditator, maybe it's just like a king who's sitting in that very kind of, you know, powerful posture, who can say? Um, yeah. So this is the Indus Valley, uh, and this is a ring. So we say they're seals, so this is, they would be made like this, and then they would be planted. So these are all clay, um, clay uh, imprints, and they would be imprinted like that. And it's not really sure like what they were. I mean, obviously they were common. Maybe they were like family emblems. Maybe they were trademarks. Maybe they were just you know, religious icons or symbols. Maybe a, maybe a combination of all of those things. Um, currency stamp seal collection. I, I can't recall now. I don't think they had currency as such, but I think they had weights. So they had organized weights which are in uh, a, six, a, a sixteenth ratio. So in the suttas it actually says it's not worth a sixteenth part of something. So that was actually the system they used for weights. Right? Something would be divided up into sixteen parts. So you find those weights. So I guess maybe a proto-currency. Yeah. So it's still a fascinating area of research. Uh, here's a slightly larger one. And I mean, you know, one thing you can see is, you know, how incredibly uh, skilled the artists were. I mean, my goodness, the, the, the modeling on all of these things. Look at, look at how skillfully the three-dimensional modeling of that is done. It's astonishingly good. And there's some human figures as well, just a couple, but they're also incredibly well, uh, well done. And these, again, very small scale. Uh, this is another one of the... Um, uh, really interesting ones. This is a very interesting one because it gives us a bit more of a tableau rather than just one thing. So we, here we have the animal, the typical animal here. Underneath someone, there's a tree. So this one's a Bodhi tree again. And in the Bodhi tree is what looks like a goddess. Yeah? A goddess in the Bodhi tree. A uh, king, it looks like. Here the king bowing down to the goddess in the Bodhi tree. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, and uh, from the positioning, right? From the positioning, I would say that it looks like, see, the, see how the animal is behind where the king is, yeah? Assuming that's a king, he's got a crown. Then, to me, that suggests that those powerful animals were a symbol of authority and symbol of kingship, uh, that they were standing behind the king. He's bowing to the goddess. And down here... Another one, two, three, four, seven, looks like seven figures, I think female figures, maybe goddesses. Some people have argued that these are the Pleiades, a constellation of seven stars. But again, everything is very, very speculative. Ah. But that's probably the closest thing that we come to an actual glimpse of life in the uh, Indus Valley. And again, you know, fascinating that you know, we're used to, from the ancient world, seeing these kind of monumental architecture, you know, the stupas in Anuradhapura or the pyramids. But here in the Indus Valley, even though it was obviously a mighty civilization, but everything is such small scale. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave, the, leave that there for now. Um, and I'll just switch this off again just to avoid too much distraction. So... with the, the Indus Valley is um, the relationship between the Indus Valley and other Indian cultures is really unknown. Generally speaking, the Indus Valley disappeared around the time that the Vedic uh, peoples arrived. Okay, so the Indo-European culture formed around uh, Central Asia, around the Caucasus. Oh, please don't do that. Single display. Thank you. Keep Sorry about that. Um, and, the, and they arrived in India, and it was around about the time that the Indus Valley civilization was disappearing, and it's not entirely sure what the relationship between those two peoples were. But it's not unreasonable to suppose that the Indus Valley civilization was in decline, and that when the Indo-European peoples came, they put the nail in the coffin with their horses and their soma. And there may have been some mixing and intermingling of those cultures. Obviously, the Indus Valley people didn't disappear, right? 
uh, the civilization might have ended, but the people were still there. So presumably their descendants are among the peoples of India today, perhaps Tamils, perhaps the Munda people, we're not really sure. Um, but anyway, so this is the Indus Valley. And I believe that we do find traces of this in the suttas. You know, the Buddha talked about what would happen if a man were to discover an ancient city in the forest. Yeah? And then you'd go and you'd, you'd, you'd say, oh, we found this ancient, it would be such an exciting discovery. Well, what ancient cities were they discovering in the forests, yeah? if not the cities of the Indus Valley? So I'm sure that, that that's at least one echo in the Buddhist uh, texts of the Indus Valley civilization. But unfortunately, we can't say too much about what their religion was. It does seem from those seals that they did have a religion. They did probably worship gods. Maybe they were doing some ascetic practices and some yoga postures or something, maybe. Now, when it comes to the Vedas, we have more of a clear idea. Uh, as I said before, mostly the Vedas are invocations of gods and so on. But after the Vedic peoples had arrived in India, and we're talking now at about eight or 900 BC, the culture settled and centralized around northwestern India in the country around modern-day Delhi that they call the Kurukshetra. And this, of course, is the scene of the great battle and the war in the Mahabharata. And that war tells the story of how the Vedic peoples were unified and how they came together. And it was from that that the Brahmanical civilization then spread across northern India uh, through to the areas that the Buddha is in, uh, the, um, northern, the Gangetic Plain, uh, and places that we know as Magadha, Kosala, uh, Vesali, and so on. So the Brahmanical um, uh, people who had inherited the uh, ancient Vedic system of knowledge uh, had probably been in the area for a few hundred years uh, by the time of the Buddha. And that means that they already had a long time to develop their ideas, to evolve their philosophy, and to, and to encounter with other people in the area, to rub shoulders with them, to pick up ideas. And this was happening uh, all the time. Now, as a result of all of these changes, they developed a, they developed a, a way of philosophical inquiry based on the old Vedic literature. And that philosophical inquiry in, is today recorded in the scriptures that we know as the Upanishads. All right? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now to have a look at some of the early Upanishads. Because it's in the Upanishads that we find for the first time a serious attempt at a systematic philosophy. We find uh, hints at a contemplative culture we find the uh, central importance, most significantly, find the central importance of the subject. Who is the knower? Yeah? This was the great question which was raised by the Upanishads. And so the Upanishadic tradition and the Brahmanical tradition at that time was anything but a fixed system they were all questioning and inquiring. As you see very commonly in the suttas, very often the Brahmins coming to the Buddha asking questions or debating among themselves. It happens all the time in the suttas. And it happens also in the Upanishads, that they are discussing and debating among themselves. Uh, even in the Upanishads, we see Brahmins going to Kshatriyas to ask questions. Yeah? So we see this, and it happens in the suttas, right? The Brahmins will come to the Buddha, who's a Katya, to ask him questions. It seems it's a bit odd, doesn't it? Why would the Brahmins go to a non-Brahmin to ask questions? But actually, even in the Upanishads, you see that same thing. Yeah? So that spirit of inquiry was there right from the beginning. And actually, that's, that idea of the spirit of inquiry uh, began, or really the first hint of it was in one of the latest hymns in the Rig Veda, a beautiful hymn about the creation of the world, and it goes and tells the story of the creation of the world. And then it finishes by saying, and... But who was it that created all of this? Who was it that underlie all of these things? Only he, only the God in the highest heaven looks down and he knows all the creation of all of this. Or perhaps even he doesn't know. So the Vedas is the only sort of theistic scripture, I think, that you find that actually says, well, maybe God doesn't know. 
Huh? And so that is opening up that seed of questioning, what actually is going on. Yeah? And this is one of the strains of Indian thought that the Buddha inherited. All right. So let's read through some Upanishads. I'll tell you what, we've been going for a little while. Why don't we do a few minutes meditation first? Just have a break for five minutes. If you want to get up and stretch. And um, begin with having a look at the uh, Brihadaranika Upanishad uh, briefly to give some background. Are we on? Okay, so the Brihadaranika Upanishad. Uh, is one of the principal Upanishads generally regarded as the earliest uh, of the Upanishads. It's a large text, which is a compilation of many different passages. It's not a unified text at all. Um, it is uh, estimated to have been uh, uh, composed uh, around the 7th to 6th centuries BCE, which puts it within a few hundred years of the Buddha. So maybe as late as, you know, 100 years before the Buddha, maybe two or 300 years before the Buddha, and in the same region, okay? So we have the same cities, Mithila, Benares, and so on. So it's the same place, and not long beforehand. Interesting that a lot of the Upanishadic action in the Brihadaranika takes place in Mithila, uh, and in the suttas, the Buddha meets a Brahman called Brahmayu, who is the oldest Brahmin who lives, supposed to be 120 years old, and he's from the city of Mithila. Interesting. Perhaps Brahmayu had, was even a student of Yajnavalkya from the Upanishads. Who knows? But it is certainly close. The point here is that it's close in time and place to where the Buddha was. Um, and the, Upani the Brihadaranika Upanishad is, I think, the most interesting of the Upanishads. Uh, and it contains a lot of different kinds of things. I'm not going to review the whole text, uh, but probably the best scholar, modern scholar on this is Patrick Olivelle, uh, and he says, any claims to date any of the Upanishads that attempts a precision closer than a few centuries is as stable as a house of cards. So we don't want to get too het up about the dating of these things, uh, but most likely a century or two before the Buddha. Brihadaranika means the great forest or the terrifying forest. And one of the distinctive features of it is that it introduces the notion of renunciation and the meditative life into the Brahmanical tradition. All right, enough summary. Uh, let's have a look at the text. So we're having a look at one of the most famous texts in the Brihadaranika uh, Upanishad. Uh, and this is a dialogue between Maitreyi and his uh, wife. Sorry, Yajnavalkya and his wife Maitreyi. Uh, and unfortunately, in the uh, Sanskrit texts, we don't have a sort of central for Sanskrit texts. So we've got an old and archaic translation. But we also have the Sanskrit here. This is from the Gretel site, which is an excellent resource for maintaining the Sanskrit. So if you want to check out the Sanskrit, it's useful to check that because anyone who knows Pali will recognize many of the forms and ideas in Pali. Okay, let's have a look. Yajnavalkya. Uh, so here Yajnavalkya lived um, not long before the Buddha in the region of Mithila, the same region the Buddha uh, lived in, uh, and uh, he's regarded as one of the foundational sages of the uh, Upanishads, of many of his dialogues found in the Brihadaranika Upanishad. Yajnavalkya had two wives, Maitreyi and Katyayani. Of these, Maitreyi was conversant with Brahman, that means with philosophy, a higher meaning of life. But Katyayani possessed only such knowledge as women possess. <laughs> what? Maybe that means that she had like this, this profound wisdom that the Brahman could not access. That's probably true, right? Brahma Vadini. Yeah. 
Sri Prajna Yaiva. So the, the word here is Sri Prajna Yaiva. Aiva, yeah? Aiva. Which you could translate as it here as it means only, but you could also translate that as specifically. Yeah? Katyayani had specifically that kind of knowledge of the wisdom of the women, maybe. Stri Pranya. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, Ayajan Valka, when he wished to get ready for another state of life uh, and to go forth, uh, then he said to Maitre, Maitre, verily, I'm going away from this house into the forest. Forsooth, he said. Let me make a settlement between thee and that Katyayani. Maitreya said, My lord, if this whole earth full of wealth belonged to me, tell me, should I become immortal by it or not? Okay? Right? Okay, let's just stop for a minute and pause on what's happening here, okay? We've, I've already had a couple of conversations here about people who want to go forth. And what happens when you tell those that you love, your family, parents, or whatever? What, how do they respond? Usually there's like, oh, I can't bear to miss you, or oh, please, you know, don't, uh, or whatever they respond. But how, how, how often does somebody respond by saying, well, if I have all of your wealth, would that make me immortal? Yeah? Right? She's a remarkable woman, yeah? And one of the interesting features of the Upanishads, and again, one of the, these things, when, this is why to me, when we look at the original texts, you know, I love the original texts of Buddhism, but also original texts in, in the Brahmanism as well, is that you see how it challenges so many assumptions. Because if you read later Brahmanical law books, it will say, oh, the, the women weren't supposed to be studying Brahma. They weren't supposed to be studying the Vedas and so on. It says she's Brahma Vadini. Yeah? She's, the, she's the one who holds the doctrine of Brahma, speaks Brahman. And she's engaging in this philosophical dialogue and she's not the only one. <clears throat> Lord, my Lord, if the whole earth full of wealth belonged to me, tell me, should I become immortal by it or not? Good question. No, replied Yajan Valka, like the life of rich people will be your life. <laughs> Right? But there's no hope of immortality by wealth. Very pertinent questions. What shall I do with that by which I do not become immortal? What my Lord knoweth of immortality, tell that to me. Well, so they're clearly they're looking for something, eh? something immortality. Uh, and the word for immortality here is. Amrita. Yeah? Amrita. Translating here as immortality. And of course, Amrita is also a word for, the, for Nibbana. Yajna Valky replied, Thou who dealt truly dear to me, you, now you've increased in. Uh, I'll, I'll try to translate it into modern, modernish English as I go. You, you, are, you are truly dear to me, and you have, uh, you have grown in what is dear to me. Therefore, if you like, lady, I will explain it to you. Mark well what I say. And he said, truly, a husband is not dear that you may love the husband, but that, that you may love the self. Therefore, a husband is dear. A wife is not dear that you may love the wife, but that may, you may love the self. Therefore, a wife is dear. Self, of course, is the Atman. And this is the great uh, argument, the great uh, thesis of the Upanishads. Sons are not dear that you may love the sons, but that may, you may love the self, therefore sons are dear. We wealth is not dear that you may love wealth, but that you may love the self. Cattle are not dear that you may love cattle, but that may, you may love the self. The Brahmins are not dear that you may love the Brahmins, that may you love the self. The Kshatriya class, the worlds are not dear. The Devas are not dear that you may love the Devas, but that you may love the self. The Vedas are not dear that you may love the Vedas. Creatures are not dear. Everything is not dear that you may love everything, but that you may love the self, therefore everything is dear. Now, again, just sort of pause a minute and reflect what he's saying here, okay? First of all, he's like literally throwing everything in his religion out the window, okay? 
Vedas don't matter, Brahmas don't matter, gods don't matter, or the Vedas are full of like, you know, let's get lots of wealth, let's get cattle, let's get our family, let's get our sons, this is how you find immortality. And he's just throwing all of that out the window, right? He's clearing that all away and saying instead we have to love ourselves. Now, either he is the ultimate narcissist, right? Or he's about to pull a trick out of his sleeve. Yeah, as a great philosopher. So this is, again, what a great philosopher does. He's building this question, making you wonder, what is going on? If none of these things matter, what is it? What, yourself? Who is, right? What is this? What is this self that is so dear to all of these things? So he's building it up. Now notice a few things about his rhetoric as well. First of all, he's using this, what's known as the Nastika method, right? which is the method of negation. Not this, not this, not this. In fact, this famous phrase, Vyajavalkya, neti. I think we have that later in the thing. Neti, neti, not that, not that. And that method of negation, of course, very commonly used by the Buddha. Right? Buddha uses this all the time. It's not this, it's not that. And if you look at something like, say, the Mulapariya Sutta, the Majjhima Nikaya number one, then actually it's not dissimilar to this, where he's going through and saying, not this and not this, it's not the eyes, not the ears, not the nose, it's not even the gods and the creatures and all of these things. Actually, it's a similar rhetorical style. Okay? So what is this self? What is this Atman that he's talking about? And then building up to the all, right? Again, something that the Buddha does as well in the um, Mulapariya Sutta. Verily, the self is to be seen, to be heard, to be perceived, to be marked. Yeah? Drastavya, srotavya, mantavya, nididhayastavya, my tray. Okay? Um, when the self has been seen, heard, perceived, and known, then all this is known. Okay? Okay? To be seen, the self is to be seen. Yeah? Databa, to be heard, sotaba. To be manta, to be thought, to be conceived. Nididhyaya, this is to be meditated, to be jhanaed upon. Yeah? So this is the first time that we're getting a hint here towards what meditation and contemplation meant. Yeah? The Arjuna Valkyrie is rejecting all of these externals. Yeah, that by which we measure ourselves and by which we think that our life is worthwhile. And instead, he's insisting that what matters is what we find inside. Yeah? To be seen. And again, you know, obviously, again, I shouldn't have to say this, and I'm not going to keep saying this. Obviously, the Buddha rejected the Atman theory, right? But at the same time, it's not entirely different to what the Buddha was saying, right? The Buddha is also saying, look inside. And what you see inside is what is to be what is really mattered. And then here we find this uh, sequence: drishte, srute, mate, vijñata. Yeah, this is, we very commonly find this group of four things in the suttas: dite, sute, mute, vijñate. Dite is what is seen, what is heard, what is thought, what is cognized. Yeah. And especially vijñāta, when vijñāta or vijñāna means consciousness, okay? So it means when you're aware of anything. But in philosophical contexts, it especially means the refined consciousness of meditation. Yeah? What he's talking about here is vijñāna is not just ordinary consciousness. He's talking about a special kind of perception through meditation. This, that's how... All of this is known, sarvang viditam. And so this, again, is one of the great theses of the Upanishads, that they are about how you know things. Okay? They're so very subjective. Okay? And again, look here, here about knowing, right? Vedanang veda, 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 veda. Everything's knowing, 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 knowing. Whoever looks for the Brahman class elsewhere than in the self has abandoned by the Brahman class. Who looks for the Kshatriyas or the worlds or the Devas or the Vedas or the creatures or for anything other than in self is abandoned by everything. All that is the self. Now, as the sounds of a drum, dung, 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 when beaten, cannot be seized externally, but when the sound is seized, the drum is seized or the beater of the drum. You might notice that this simile, the exact simile, is found in the suttas. Yes? 
you find exact same simile. And in the similar context as well, right? He's talking about meditation and spreading metta across the world and so on, and the sound of the drum. And the sound of the drum, there's like these foolish people who are looking for the, drum, the sound of the drum and they say, where can we find it, where can we find it? And they get the drum and they pull it apart. There's no sound in here. <laughs> yeah? Same thing. Yeah? Sound of the conch shell when blown. Also, similarly what you find in the suttas. So it's one of the things about this passage. Every, almost everything in this passage actually has something in common with the suttas. Almost every sentence. Yeah. The sounds of a conch shell when blown. So this is a simile the Buddha used for the Brahma Viharas, blowing the conch shell across the four quarters. The sounds of a lute also. The little simile of a lute we find. Actually, in the, in the, um, what we translate as a lute is the uh, vena, I think. So, uh, yeah, the vena. Uh, and the vena uh, at the time, not the same as a modern vena, but it was what, it's probably what they call the arched harp. So there's still similar instruments used in Myanmar today. Uh, maybe, maybe in Bangladesh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but they use, technically it's an arched harp, but they usually translate it as lute. I translate it as arched harp because I care about these things, okay? <laughs> they, they weren't plucking lutes in ancient India, come on. Anyway. <coughs> Uh, as the sounds, clouds of smoke proceed by themselves out of lighted fire kindled with damp fuel. Mm, okay? Interesting image, yeah? The fire, pure, bright energy, but the smoke that comes out of that fire, that is what the Rig Veda, the, all the different Vedas, all of the uh, Itihasa, the Purana, the Vidya, Upanishad, Slokas, Sutras, and so on. These are all the sacred scriptures of the Brahmins. Again, many of these mentioned in the suttas. Yeah? Uh, also kind of interesting, right? Because it's almost saying that the Vedas, they're just the smoke, right? That's not the real thing. That's the sign that the th real thing is there. And again, not dissimilar to the way that the Buddha related to scriptures, right? It's a bit like the, that's the Zen simile, like the finger pointing to the moon, right? So the, the, the Dhamma that you realize is not the finger pointing to it. So the smoke is like a signal. That's a sign that there is a fire there, but that's not what really matters. What really matters is the fire. Okay, as all creatures, all waters find their center in the sea. All touches in the skin, all tastes in the tongue, all smells in the nose, all colors in the eye, all sounds in the ear, all percepts in the mind, all knowledge in the heart, all actions in the hands, all movements in the feet, and all the Vedas in speech. Okay? Another very interesting passage here. Uh, the word here, find their center, okay, he's translated, the Pali word ekayana. Ekayana. Many of you be familiar with this. Ekayano ayang bikawe maggo. Satanang visudhiya. From the Satipatthana Sutta. And so again, this is as so often the Buddha was adopting language from the Brahmanical tradition and giving it his own spin. The fact that the Buddha did that is not just a hypothesis. Okay? Why? Because in the Brahma Sangyuta, that phrase, ekayana magga, is put into the mouth of Brahma. It's actually Brahma who says that. Yeah? So Brahma is saying, oh, this is the ekayana magga, and he's using the language that he knew. Yeah? And so you can see here what the meaning of it is. It's a place where everything comes together. Yeah? Everything converges. Yeah? Everything comes together, or waters come together in the sea, or touches in the skin. So it's that unification of things. As a mass of salt has neither inside nor outside, but is altogether a mass of taste. Yeah? So a bit, bit reminiscent of the, the, the idea of the, the ocean having just one taste, a taste of salt. Thus indeed this self has neither inside nor outside, but is altogether a mass of knowledge. Yeah? A mass of, of, of consciousness, I think it is. A prajnana ganameva. I think there's a variant reasoning. Yeah? Krishna, ah, oh, it's also good to know. Krishna prajna ganameva. Ah, see you again soon. Yes, I know. Yes, I'll see you again soon. So prajnana, 
or in some readings, I think it's Vijnana as well. I think there's variants there. Vijnana Ganameva, Prajnana Ganameva. That self is pure knowing, pure awareness, pure consciousness. Notice also here the word Krishna, meaning entirely a mass of consciousness. This is the same word in Pali that we have as Kasina. Yes, you know Kasina? So Kasina is a disc that you watch for your meditation. But actually, the original meaning of kasina means a totality. And in the suttas, that's always what it means. Kasina in the suttas means a totality. It means the kasina of, of, of light means that everything is light. Yeah? So it's like a samadhi which is based on the totality of light. You can see here that, again, this is a mere drawing from this particular Upanishadic passage. And just to be clear, it is not the case that everything in the Upanishads has such close relation to Buddha's texts, okay? Even, I mean, in some of them, I haven't even noticed all of the, all of the ones. So, for example, even the dialogue between Yajna Valkyar and Maitreyi is actually quite similar to the dialogue between King Persenadi and his wife Malika, where they're talking about who do you love more dear, is there anyone you love more dear than yourself? Yeah? Actually, very similar. Right? So this is, again, when we're pointing to these kinds of connections, right? We don't want to point to connections just by saying there's one thing here and one thing there, right? Because that can be just coincidence, right? But when you find that there's a pattern where, like, almost everything in the passage has some kind of connection with something we find in Buddhism, then clearly there is an influence there, right? And I think clearly the Buddha knew this passage and clearly he drew upon... Uh, the uh, images and ideas here. So there's, there's definitely an affinity. Okay. So the self, neither inside nor outside, but it's altogether a sheer mass of knowledge, a sheer mass of consciousness. Having arisen out from these elements, vanishes into them once more. When he is departed, there is no more perception, no more sanya. Thus spoke Yajnavalkya. Yeah. So this is an interesting line and is one which is a bit uh, controversial in interpretation. It's possible to interpret this as positing that there is no survival uh, of the self after death, right? The self, the consciousness comes out from these elements supported by this body and when it goes back, then there is no more perception. But uh, I, I think it doesn't quite mean that because it says na pretya sanjna there's no, there is no perception after death. Yeah? And I think, I think it, certainly in Buddhist usage, and I think the sense here that he's pointing to is that sanya is a kind of like a limiting perception. So there's no like, like, there's no like that worldly limiting perception of all of these different things that one has gone back to that mass of consciousness. Yeah? That's what I think it probably means. But it's a bit um, hard to interpret. Having said it's hard to interpret, Maitreyi said, Sir, now you have landed me in utter bewilderment. I do not understand anything you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, again, what a great dialogue, right? To, to just record that, you know, it's just this kind of spontaneous thing. I mean, it's not like, that's the kind of thing that gives this sense of realism to it, right? I mean, if you wanted to just make it up, you'd say, oh, yes, yeah, Sadhu, Sadhu, that was so wonderful. But instead, she's like, I really don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so he said, Maitreya, I say nothing that is bewildering. Verily, beloved, that self is imperishable and of an indestructible nature. And, uh, of course, this is where the Buddha would depart from what Yajna Valky is talking about, uh, Avinashi. So to, uh, to speak of that self as being imperishable is um, not tenable. For when there is, a, as it were, a duality... Yatra hi dvaitamiva bhavati. It's an interesting phrasing for where there is a duality, as it were, eva. Mm. Then one sees the other, smells the other, tastes the other, salutes the other, hears the other, perceives the other, touches the other. So it's saying that we're living, we, we, we live in this world that's as if there was a duality. It's not that there is a duality, it's as if there was one. Yeah? And so we think that we can see and touch and so on things that are outside ourself. But in reality, when the self is only all this, how can you see another? How can you smell another? How could you taste another? How could you salute another, hear another, touch another? How could you know another? No? 
actually is all just one from the beginning. How could he know him by whom he knows all this? Yene dang sarvang vejanati dang kena vijaniat. That self is to be described by not that, not that. Saesa neti neti atma. I don't know if Yajnavaki really thought he was clearing up Maitreyi's confusion at this point. <laughs> but it's certainly not getting easier. Huh? But when you, when you see these things and you hear these things, again, try to step out of hearing it from a doctrinal point of view. Okay? We're not reading this as a Buddhist critique. If I'm going to be a Buddhist philosopher, then I can read it and I can criticize it in various ways. I want you to hear it as if you were those people there. Yajnavalkya clearly is someone who's very sincere and very intelligent and very wise. And he is seeking for an answer to these very profound questions. And he's doing so through this very, very interesting and deep insight. I mean, from these, the whole non-dual uh, Upanishadic, Vedic, and uh, later the Hindu tradition came up as fuel all of these philosophies. And he's in a very earnest conversation with his wife about this, yeah, to try to explain why do you want to do something so strange as to go forth and to seek liberation. So it's a very, it, to me, it's a very pure and very powerful uh, dialogue. Yeah? Just not that, not that. And again, that doctrine of negation which the Buddha came up with again and again and again. Neso hamasmi. Right? But the phrasing again is slightly different. Sa esa neti neti atma. That self is not that, not that. Yeah? The Buddha said that is not the self. Yeah? Taking the same thing and just rephrasing it a little bit. No? He is incomprehensible for he cannot be comprehended cannot be grasped, you cannot grab hold of him. He's imperishable, for he cannot perish. He's unattached, for he does not attach himself. He's unfettered, he does not suffer, he does not fail. How, O oh beloved, should he know the knower? Again, this question he's asking, Vijnatarang are kena vijayati. How do you know the knower? Thus, O Maitreya, you have been instructed, thus far goes immortality. Yeah? Immortality is when you know the knower. So one of the questions that I want to uh, think about, I want to try to raise is like, where does all of this come from? Like, why was Yajnavalkya thinking this way? What is he pointing to? Why is he going forth? What does he mean when he's talking about how do you know the knower? Yeah? And in the Upanishads, especially in the early Upanishads, you don't find a very explicit and clear description of meditation. Not like you find in the suttas. Okay? The suttas is very straightforward. Goes away into the forest, sits down cross-legged, sits his body sits straight, watches your breath coming in, everything's described. You know, we know exactly what they're doing. Upanishads, we don't find that. Yeah? And so we can question and say, well, what kind of culture was this? Like, why were they like this? And it, it seems to me that everything about that dialogue is from a meditative culture. I mean, this sounds to me like a meditator who's talking. He's constantly coming back and pointing to that subjective knowing of things. How do you know the knower? The one who knows all these things, how do you know the knower? And to me, there's only one answer to that, is through meditation. That's how you know the knower. Yeah? And so, to me, these passages are one of the foundations that's pointing towards where meditation is heading. Like, what is that basis of meditation? And when I see in the suttas uh, some of the great Brahmanical rishis, probably the Buddha's former teacher, Alara Kalaman Uddhakarama Putta, uh, or the uh, great Brahmins, the 16 Brahmins of the Parayana Wagga, uh, who are practicing these very deep meditations and other Brahmas who are doing similar things, you know, to me, they sound like they are the heirs of Yajnavalkya and his tradition. Yeah? That's, this, this is the tradition that they're practicing in. And this is what they're inspired by. Yeah? It's really amazing 
like when we think of those, you know, I, I can still, like reading through those passages, like, I can still feel the power of those insights right now. And those, those understandings and those insights have, have inspired so many and fueled so many to undertake spiritual and religious practices. Still today, and still even in Buddhism, you find so many people in Buddhism who are effectively teaching something which is very much like what Yajnavalkya is teaching, actually. Yeah? I'm not going to name names, but there are a lot of popular Buddhist teachers whose teachings are pretty much indistinguishable from what Yajnavalkya is saying. How much of a spell right, that this insight has put on the human mind, how, how, how attractive it is, how much it draws you in, to think that we can know everything by knowing our self. Yeah? And elsewhere, of course, it talks about how that self also is Brahman, yeah? which is the world. It's such a powerful idea that we can meditate and become one with the world and with the cosmos. Yeah? And it's not until, and this is why empathy is so important when we're reading sacred scriptures, it's not until we can fully feel how powerful and meaningful that idea is that we can understand what the Buddha did when he said no, when he left. Can you imagine? Yeah? He said, no, this is not good enough. Yeah? This is not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking. Yeah? My tray. Should I become immortal by it or not? Yeah? The Buddha is not looking for immortality. Yeah? The Buddha, uh, Arya Pariyasana, the Buddha said, what is there that's beyond birth, beyond aging, beyond death? He didn't want to live forever. Yeah? He wanted to step outside of this whole thing. So this is the power of the Buddha's renunciation and the power of the Buddha's wisdom, that even when he had the opportunity to practice to get reborn in these formless attainments for most of us, that's pretty good, right? You know, do some meditation for a few years and then you get like 60,000 eons of blissful abiding. I don't know, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> and the Buddha's like, no, not good enough. Yeah. There's a kind of overlap there in the beginning, right? Because he's talking in a way that's, that's kind of like, that's, that's almost psychological in the beginning. Yeah? But then later on, he makes it clear that what he's talking about is a metaphysical reality. So he says the self is imperishable. Yeah? So this is that point where you cross that line. You say, well, actually, no, this is something that, that's something metaphysical. Yeah? A self that exists forever. I think the idea is that it's imperishable because it is the world. It is the cosmos and it's God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I interesting you know, um, question because um, uh, the word non-duality. So here we have the, the uh, dwaya mentioned in this line. All right, so, oh, where are we now? Uh, no. Where are they? Where's dwaya? Anyway, um, so that, that is if there is a duality. The Buddha talked about a duality if in a few different uh, contexts. Uh, for example, you have like the two extremes, which are like a duality, which to be escaped from. Or he talked about a meditation attainment as being non-dual, a dwayan. Yeah, so these kinds of things. But he never really described nibbana as being non-dual. Yeah. Again, it's close language. But the, the thing is that when, when, you, when you're looking at these things, especially these very subtle things like talking about nibbana and so on, the Buddha was extremely careful in how he talked about it. The kinds of language that he used, the kind of metaphors, 
Yeah? And it was a very nice, nicely pointed out by Morris Walsh one time, uh, his introduction to the Diga Nikaya. And he said that, you know, if you compare the idea of Nibbana with the idea of God, uh, whether Christian God or Hindu God or whatever, then actually there are many things you can say are very similar. You can say, well, that they don't die. You can say that they, are, uh, they have no, no evil in them and so on and so forth. So you can say there are many things that are similar. But he said one of the things which is different is that uh, theists will go on to say a bunch of other things about their gods that the Buddha would not say about Nibbana. So, for example, they'd say that their gods created the world, right? And the Buddha didn't say that. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, or even to describe it as being unconditioned. Yeah? So you can say God is unconditioned, but he created the world. And so it's when you say all of those extra things that you start to create problems. You know, the Buddha said Nibbana is unconditioned. It's simple, right? God is also unconditioned, but God created the world. How can something be unconditioned and a creator? Right? This is where it gets philosophically complex. Yeah? And so this is why, again, the Buddha was very precise both in what he said and what he did not say. Yeah. This, and this is really important, I think, when reading uh, suttas and reading the Upanishads in line with them, because if you want to say there are these things that are similar in the suttas and the Upanishads, yes, you can say that. There are many things that are similar, actually. Yeah? But there's also things that are different, and there are things that the Buddha did not say. Now, one of them, of course, being the self is imperishable. Sure. The path to Kunibana is conditioned, yeah. Yeah. What is unconditioned? Yes. Uh, here, sir, thou hast landed me in utter bewilderment. <laughs> Again, that's not that you shouldn't see that as being a problem because these are, in fact, very difficult and very profound things. And if they are bewildering, good. If you think you understand them, you're probably delusional, right? <laughs> You think you understand these things, you're either enlightened or delusional. And statistically speaking, I'm just going to say, <laughs> the odds are not in your favor. Okay? So we try, have to understand these things little bit by little bit. Yeah? You can't, don't try to understand them all at once. Little bit by little bit, you grow in your understanding. Yeah. yeah. Ah, uh, I don't think so, no, just, have, just a coincidence, yeah. It's, there's, a few, there's a few Maitreyas and Metteyas around the place. How many? You want me to make a list? A lot. I mean, look, you, you know, you can see even this passage here, many points of similarity, yeah? Similar language, similar ideas, similar uh, metaphors, uh, similar, like, uh, linguistic style, argument style, so a lot of different similarities. But at the same time, I've deliberately chosen one of the passages that is the most similar to the suttas, yeah? And so I can, I can easily pick other passages that are very alien to the suttas. I mean... Just, uh, let's just have a look at one example from the beginning of the Upanishad, the beginning of the Brihadaranyaka, the first, first chapter, Brihadaranyaka. Verily, the dawn is the eye of the horse, which is fit for sacrifice, the sun its eye, the wind its breath, the mouth, the Vaishvarana, fire, the ear, the body of the sacrificial horse. Heaven is the back, the sky is the belly, the earth, the chest, the quarters, the two sides, the intermediate quarters. And on and on it goes. The half-digested food is the sand and the bowels. Verily, day arose after the horse as a golden vessel called Mahiman, which at the sacrifice is placed before the horse. And on and on it goes like that. Okay? So this does not sound very like Buddhism at all. Yeah? So this is what I was saying. The Upanishads are a compilation. Yeah? And 
there's a lot of great philosophy. There's also a lot of these kind of ritual things, and uh, yeah. So we can't sort of treat it as one just unified mass, yeah. But I do believe, like one of the reasons why I'm talking about it, one of the reasons I try to bring it up, is because I do believe that both in, in Buddhist culture as well as in Buddhist uh, uh, academics, there is a neglect or lack of understanding of what the Upanishads are and how the Buddha responded to them. And I think that we often, a lot of teachers don't really have any that kind of knowledge of those things. And they tend to, uh, tend to sort of speak out of um, like, like assumptions that we bring to it rather than really trying to understand it. So this for me is like really important again to, to try to bring a sense of empathy, to try to understand these things, not to criticize them. It's easy to, it, look, it's easy to criticize these things, right? But to bring a sense of empathy and humanity and, you know, I really feel that, th that in the, especially the Brihadaranika Upanishad, I feel it's the most human of the Upanishads, you know. I feel like these are real people who are having real discussions that really mattered to them. And they're not just, they're not just sort of um, propounding their philosophy, you know. They're wrestling with topics that are really difficult. And to me, that's much more vital and much more alive. Now, um, for this next session, we're going to uh, broaden our scope from the Brahmanical tradition, and we're going to look a little bit at the Jain tradition. And I'm going to begin by giving a little bit more background, coming a bit closer to the time of the Buddha. So we've seen with uh, Yajnavalkya that uh, there was this movement from the traditional Vedic position, which is very much about empowering the gods, about defeating the enemies, but also about the, the fertility and prosperity of the land, about gaining wealth and these kinds of things, to a far more philosophical and renunciate um, uh, 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 interest in the, uh, in the Upanishads. Now, these changes were not happening in isolation, but they were happening in conversation and engagement with a wide variety of different people in ancient India. One uh, preconception to dispel when considering uh, the time of the Buddha in ancient India was that it was Hindu. This is what the Hindus would like you to believe. <laughs> but it is not, okay? And uh, ancient India was a diverse and uh, extremely diverse and complex religious scene. Now, if we've seen, as we have seen, the Vedas and the Brahmanical tradition, yes, were there, and they were very powerful and very prominent. But they weren't the only thing that was there. We find many times people are worshipping their local gods, local Nagas or Yakas or something. These have really nothing to do with the, the Vedas and the Brahmanical traditions. Many of the gods in the Vedas had disappeared completely by the time of the Buddha. They're not mentioned at all in the suttas. Uh, at the same time, there are many deities and gods and so on mentioned in the suttas that are never found in the Vedas. Yeah? Also, many gods found in later Hinduism who are not mentioned in the suttas at all. Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesh, Krishna, um, skanda, on and on it goes. You know, so many things we find in modern Hinduism that really just didn't even exist then. So yes, there was a continuity of a religious tradition which evolved into what we know of today as Hinduism. If you want to use the word Hinduism, sure, that's okay. But it's not the same. Right? And so you have to bear in mind, for example, there were no temples. Right? That's a big difference. Right? In the Vedas, all the worship was outdoors. Actually, in India, for around 500 years after the Buddha, there's no Hindu temples at all, no Brahmanical temples at all. Or it's all Buddhist and Jain and Ajivika. So um, uh, it was a complex tradition, and everybody was interacting with everybody else, and this was a normal thing. Again, as we find in the suttas, constantly the Buddha popping next door to the ashram to have a chat with the wanderers, right? meeting some Jains along the road, having a conversation. This is happening all the time. And so the Brahmins were being influenced by these new movements that were arising. And the generic term we used for those new movements was the Shramana movements or the Samana movements in Pali. Okay? And in Indian literature, these are like cats and dogs. Okay? 
samanas and brahmanas. Yeah? Yeah. They're like cats and dogs. Yeah? So samana and brahmana, they're two kinds of religious people. And in fact, uh, when uh, Padanjali wanted to illustrate a grammatical form, he said that there is a certain syntactical usage that indicates two things that are perpetually antagonistic towards each other, <laughs> such as samanas and brahmins. Right? So it was a very um, uh, diverse and lively culture. And again, we see this constantly through the suttas, people criticizing, engaging, learning, being converted, going from one community to another, happening all the time. Now, among those, who were these, who were these shramanas, right? Where did these samana movements come from? Well, we, we probably know less about the origins of the samana movements than we do about the brahmins, mainly because the old samana texts don't exist. So the brahmins already had a very sophisticated uh, textual tradition, and so we can read the Rig Veda and read these other texts and get a good idea, uh, at least some things, what they were saying and what they believed. Most of the Samana traditions that were around in the time of the Buddha have since disappeared. Uh, and only a few have survived. Really, the only prominent ones that have survived are the Buddhists, of course, and the Buddha counted himself as one of the Samanas. Right? So the Buddha said, I'm not, not one of the Brahmins, he said, I'm one of the Samanas. And uh, the other one, of course, being the Jains. And even in the time of the Buddha, the Jains were probably the most uh, prominent and most popular of these different Samana movements. And of course, they've survived to the present day. And uh, even where I live in Sydney, uh, we have some of our uh, friends and people in the local area are Jains. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the ladies who lives on the corner near us, whose name is Deepika, as it happens, uh, she and her family are Jains. And we got to know her because of their bunnies. So they have bunny rabbits, and they take them out to the back of their place and sit with them as they graze every hour, every day, for like an hour a day. And so we got to know them because they're looking after their cute little bunnies, and so that's how we got to know them. And this, of course, is the first principle of Jainism, right? non-harming yeah? and respect for all life. And with the Jains, as with the Brahmins, we can find many things that are in common. And a lot of teachings, you know, things like Brahma Viharas or the five precepts and things are very, fairly widely shared across the uh, Indian uh, different religions. It seems that the Samana movements were somewhat older than the Buddha, right? So they were already around when the Buddha uh, became enlightened. Uh, probably, you know, probably a bit older, you know, probably if they've been around for a few generations, probably, I'm guessing, right, and this is really just speculative, but I'm guessing that the Samana movement ultimately drew from local practices, right, so not from the, the Brahmins and the uh, Indo-Europeans who arrived in India, but from the people who were there before, uh, and probably evolved from the witch doctors, shamans, the word shaman is not the same as samana, just in case you're wondering, shamans, witch doctors, medicine men, whatever, the ritual specialists who, knowledge holders within the local tribes and the local peoples. And somehow through there, I, I suspect that we have evolved the samana class. Hard to say, again, we've really lost a lot of that early history. Now, <clears throat> most of uh, what our main source for a lot of these uh, early summoners is in fact in the suttas and the Pali texts. And the Pali texts are probably the oldest real record of a lot of these uh, movements. In fact, sometimes it's the only record of them. Uh, for the Jains, they do, there is an extensive Jain literature, but it was, it has a, it has a, um, there's a sort of a question mark over the, the lineage of the Jain literature. It was said to be lost and then reconstituted. And so there wasn't like a continuity of the tradition. So it's not exactly clear really what happened there. Um, but uh, in any case, we're going to be looking at one of the Jain texts, which, is, which seems fairly early uh, and seems to be a record of an early text. Um, 
Now, the Buddha was a contemporary of the Jain leader called Mahavira, uh, who in the Buddhist text is called Nigata Nataputta. Okay? Uh, he wasn't the founder of the Jains. The founder was in a previous generation, but he was the leader of the Jains in uh, the Buddha's time. The Jains were characterized by, on the one hand, their relentless commitment to the principle of non-harming, which they took to an even greater extreme than the Buddhists did or the Brahmins did. Everybody embraced, at least in principle, this theory of non-harming, but for the Jains, it was very, very central. And on the other hand, they also embraced the practices of self-mortification. Now, these practices of self-mortification were around before then. And we can probably trace an evolution in how they were used and how they were conceived. Originally, probably, these practices were done in order to gain magical powers, to gain siddhi. Yeah? So you do these kinds of self-torment, and then you gain an ability to maybe put a curse on someone or maybe fly through the air, or whatever. Yeah? Different kinds of powers that people would want. But gradually it might have evolved until people were, by the time of the Buddha in any case, when the Jains were doing their practices of self-mortification, they wanted to realize the immortality of the soul. Very briefly, the Jain philosophy was that each one of us has an individual soul, which they called a jiva. And we find this mentioned many times in the suttas. We've already talked about the atman, which is the brahmanical idea of the soul. And the brahmanical idea is the individual soul is the same as the cosmos. Yeah? That's the atman. For the Jains, the jiva was an individual soul. It, was not, uh, it wasn't going to merge into the cosmos or anything like that but your individual soul was inherently pure and omniscient. Yeah? However, it was defiled by asavas, yeah? defiled by impurities and pollutants. Yeah? Also, they called kama. So the, Jains believe, the, the Jain idea is almost a kind of quasi-physical idea, like this soul is almost a physical thing. Yeah? And these come and so on is almost like this material component which is, which is darkening the, the soul and darkening one's ability to know. And so the purpose of the Jain practices was to create fire, tapas, yeah? through pain, lots and lots and lots of pain. Yeah? And that burnt up the body and created this inner heat and this inner fire. They called tapas. And through that fire, you purify your soul and burn off all of those impurities. So this Jain philosophy, it's almost kind of like a quasi-physicalist philosophy. So for example, like in Buddhism, that we won't kill any living creature, okay? But if we're walking along the path and we step on an ant, well, okay, maybe we feel sorry for the ant. We don't want to do that. But we don't feel that we're responsible for that because we didn't have any intention to kill. So for Buddhists, it's intention which matters. But for a Jain, no. For a Jain, if you're walking along the path and you step on the ant, then you make the bad karma from that. Yeah? Because it's the physical act of killing. Yeah? There's even a passage in one of the Jain sutras uh, where, where they're criticizing the Buddhists and they say that the Buddha said, okay, uh, so this is in a Jain Sutra, attributing to the Buddha, they said, the Buddha said that if you get a baby and roast it up in a fire and then eat it, then that's a meal fit for a king. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's no intention, right? So this is how they were criticizing the Buddhists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so because of this uh, physical thing, because then the, that, the, the physical discipline was emphasized within the Jain movement. So for example, 
uh, they would often go naked. Yeah? So the Jains had like two orders. Some of them were naked, some of them were clothes. Yeah? Uh, sometimes they would, they had rules like, for example, they weren't allowed to bathe, right? This is, this is why like in places like Australia, you don't tend to see many Jane ascetics because it's not easy to get on the plane if you're, if you're A, naked and B, haven't bathed for 10 years. <laughs> um, and... You know, and they're very, and the Jane texts go into a lot of details about this. For example, if you're, if you're crossing over on a boat over water and you happen to fall in, okay, you're not allowed to delay while getting out. You're not allowed to sneakily have a bath and say, well, I've fallen in the river now. I might as well bathe for the first time in 10 years. No, 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 no. You have to get out quickly as you can. And uh, so they're very uh, strict in all of these kinds of things. So um, let's have a look at one of the Jain texts. And we're going to be looking at a passage from the Uttara Dhyayana Sutra. And I will briefly um, check the uh, Wikipedia for this. I don't think I have the um, Indic text for this. The Jain texts, uh, by the way, uh, or the early texts, were written in what they call Ardha Magadhi, uh, which is a, a similar language to the, what's found, it's similar to Pali, but it's similar to what's found on the um, uh, similar to what's found in the Ashokan edicts. This is not the text we're reading, but this is the only one on Gretel, that's the only Indic text they have. Uh, so this, just to give you an idea, this is the Jain language. Uh, and this is maybe a bit later, but anyway, you can see that it's very similar to Pali. Kala vada, swabhava vada, niyati vada, karma vada, kaladi sam, sama gri vada. So most of these things are quite understandable to anyone who knows Pali. Kshanika vada. Buddha vachanam. Shanakavada. I'm not quite sure. I, I'm not even quite sure what the context is. Why they're saying Buddha Vachana? Maybe they're saying that the Buddhists taught a kind of Kanikavada. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, I should mention also that apart from what I mentioned, the the ethics and the self modification practices, the Jains also had a very sophisticated and, and advanced philosophy. Right. So there's a there's a whole thing of Jain philosophy which is very sophisticated, which we won't go into. Um, but uh, Briefly here, um, the Uttaradhyayana Sutra, one of the most important uh, sacred books of the Swetambara Jains. They're the white-clothed Jains. Uh, it consists of 36 chapters, believed by some to claim, contain the actual words of Bhagavan Mahavira. So as I said, uh, the uh, transmission of these texts is much less well attested than it is in Pali. And as you can also see, not much information on Wikipedia, and uh, yeah, Jain texts are even less studied than uh, Buddhist texts. Anyway, all right, uh, Uttara Dhyayana, where are we now? Okay, so this is uh, the eighth lecture in the Uttara Dhyayana Sutra. By what acts can I escape a sorrowful lot in this unstable, in, in eternal samsara, which is full of misery? Quitting your former connections, place your affection on nothing. A monk who loves not even those who love him will be freed from sin and hatred. Then the best of sages who is exempt from delusion and possesses perfect knowledge and faith speaks for the benefit and eternal welfare and for the final liberation of all beings. So again, just notice how many things very similar to Buddhism, right? That idea of looking for the final liberation for all beings? Absolutely, yeah? We could find that kind of thing in Buddhism as well. All fetters of the soul, all hatred, everything of this kind should a monk cast aside. He should not be attached to any pleasures, examining them well and taking care of himself. A stupid, ignorant sinner who never fixes his thoughts on the soul's benefit and eternal welfare, but sinks down through hatred and the temptation of lust, 
will be ensnared as a fly is caught on glue. It is difficult to cast aside the pleasures of life. Weak men will not easily give them up. But there are pious ascetics, sadhus, who get over the impassable samsara as merchants cross the sea. The mention of merchants crossing the sea is significant uh, because there's no real um, evidence of international trade across the sea in the suttas. That happened a few, like about a century later. Um, and we even find in the Jataka stories, one of my favorite Jataka stories is the story of the, the beginnings of the trade to Persia. Should I tell you that story? It's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. So there's a Jataka story where the, where the Indians set, sail the first ship up the coast and they go to Persia and they take all of these, whatever they have, cloths and gems and all of these things to sell and to make money from the Persians. And when the, the ship was in the dock, uh, there was a crow that had settled on the ship's mast when they had set sail from India. And they arrived in Persia and the, the Persian traders looked at all of the cloth and they looked at all of the gems and they looked at these things and they're like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. And they said, but what's that? And they pointed to the crow and they said, wow, that's really extraordinary. And we don't have anything like that. They said, it's a crow. They said, wow. What? And then the crow took off and flew through the air. And of course, as everybody knows, there are no birds in Persia. Well, <laughs> of course there are birds in Persia, but the Indians didn't know that, right? So they were saying, how much, for the, how much for that wonderful beast? How much for that incredible bird? And so they haggled and sold the crow for a magnificent price to the Persian traders. And then when they got back on the boat, they just looked at each other and they said, next time, peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, anyway, so trade across the sea. Right. But again, you know, look at how that's, that's, um, that's, that's positioned there, right? So, so to cross the ocean, right, is something that's so incredibly difficult and dangerous and impossible. That's the simile, right? We wouldn't use that simile. For us to cross the ocean is very normal. You just get in a plane or in a boat and cross the ocean. Anyway. There are some here who call themselves summoners, though they are like the beasts, ignorant of the prohibition of killing living beings. The stupid sinners go to hell through their superstitious beliefs. Mm. Harsh, right? Yeah? Stupid, ignorant sinner. Like, I, I, you know, I can't vouch for the, the translation exactly, but one of the things that you find, like, you know, many of these things are not that different from you find in Buddhism, right? But in the Jain texts, they're always a, they're always a bit more hardcore, right? It's always a bit kind of harsher. The Buddhist texts are always a bit softer, a bit more gentle the way they talk about things, you know? And this one, it's pretty hard. Oh, they're, they're like ignorant beasts killing people. They're going to go to hell. It, I don't know. It's, it's pretty strong. Anyway, one should not permit or consent to the killing of living beings. Then he will perhaps be delivered from all misery. Thus have spoken the preceptors who have proclaimed the law of ascetics. A careful man who does not injure living beings is called circumspect, samita. The sinful karman will quit him as water quits raised ground. Yeah? So again, just to sort of point out that in both Jainism and Buddhism and Brahmanism, have the idea of karma, right? Actually, in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad and in the dialogues with Yandjanvalkya, this is the first time that we hear the doctrine of karma in the Vedic tradition. Right? I didn't talk about it, but that's, that's there. The Jains also have this idea of karma. But the idea of karma is not necessarily the same, right? So they all talk about it, but they all mean something that's slightly different. So he, for the Jains, the karma is something which is inherently painful and inherently evil which you have to dispel and so that distinction Buddhism makes, Buddhism makes a distinction between good karma and bad karma we encourage good karma we also encourage going beyond all karma but for the Jains they have to get rid of all of their karma again we find this idea talked about in the suttas yeah? 
in, in thoughts, words, and acts. He should do nothing injurious to, peoples, to beings who people the world, whether they move or not. Yeah. Again, sound very much, you could find that in a Buddhist text. He should know what arms may be accepted and should strictly keep these rules. A monk should bed food only for the sustenance of life and should not be dainty. And we'll see a little bit later uh, what this means about the arms that should be accepted. He should eat what tastes badly. Cold food, old beans, wakasapulaga. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound great. <laughs> And for the sustenance of his life, he should eat mangu, ground butterer. Do you know what, you know what butterer is? Presumably like a, like, a, like a ground grain or probably like maybe chaff or something like that. Maybe like in the, in the vineyard when the, the, um, there was a, 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 a famine and they were eating like the ground grain from the horse food and mashing it up. Maybe something like that. Anyway, obviously, obviously monks are not supposed to eat good food. Those who interpret the marks of the body and dreams and who know the foreboding changes in the body, the angavidya, are not to be called summoners. So that thus the uh, preceptors have declared. This also is exactly the same as we find in Buddhism. Uh, in places like the Brahmajala Sutta, uh, we have detailed uh, exposition of exactly what all of these things are. So this is talking about like fortune tellers and soothsayers and these kinds of things. So the Jains say these are not, um, uh, not true ascetics. Angavidya. Angavidya is literally like the, the knowledge of the, the limbs and the marks and signs on the body. Those who do not take their life under discipline, who cease from meditation and ascetic practices, who are desirous of pleasures, amusements, and good fare, will be born again as asuras. So... Now, it uses the word meditation here. I'm not sure exactly what it means. The Pali is samadhi yoga. So it sounds like it means meditation. But I'm not, I don't know enough about the context to actually say exactly what that means by meditation there. Generally speaking, the Jains were not so much into meditation. There's some kind of hints of like a contemplative meditation tradition but generally they're much more into the self-mortification. So I'm not quite sure what they mean by the meditation there. When they rise in another birth from the world of Asuras, they err about for a long time in Sangsara. Those who are sullied with many sins will hardly ever attain Bodhi. Yeah? So again, this idea of the soul, the jiva, who's sullied by many sins. That's the idea I was talking about before, the jiva is sullied. If somebody should give the whole earth to one man, he would not have enough. So difficult it is to satisfy anybody. Same idea we found in Buddhism, Ratapada Sutta and other places. The more you get, the more you want. Your desires increase with your means. <laughs> Still true, right? Still very true. I mean, you see that today. I mean, my goodness, you see, you know, you see the richest man alive today. You know, someone like Elon Musk, more, he's got more things than anyone ever in history, right? $200 billion or more. What does he want? He wants to colonize Mars. Yeah? This earth is not good enough, Mars, and then he wants to colonize the galaxy. He wants to be emperor of the galaxy. Yeah. Really astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. This is just so true. You'd think, you'd think that there has to be a limit to human desires somewhere. You know, like in the suttas, it talks about that with, uh, you know, the kings who were like in the Ratapala sutta, the king, or you conquer all these countries. No, yes, of course I would. And he would go, and there'd be no end to that. Yeah? And so many stories in Buddhism like that. But you, you think there must be some end somewhere, <laughs> right? But no, yeah? If they get a glimpse to be able to, to literally rule the entire galaxy, then they will. This is what Elon Musk is doing. Everything that he's doing is towards that. Mars is just a stepping stone. Yeah. Sorry? Well, I, I don't know if I wish him to die, but maybe if he, maybe he, he, he doesn't seem to be that stable, so I'm not sure if he's going to actually keep his stuff together anyway 
Anyway, um, where are we? <clears throat> uh, right, the more you get, the more you want. Your desires increase with your means. Though two marshes would be enough to supply your wants, still you would barely think 10 million sufficient. Marshes, presumably a coin. Do not desire women, those female demons. <laughs> on whose breasts grow two lumps of flesh, who continually change their mind. <laughs> who entice men, then make a sport of them as slaves. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyone, any comments? <laughs> right? Nuns, yeah? Jane, Jane Nigantanese, yeah? Yeah. Yes, there were, and they were before the Bakunis, right? They already existed, and um, there were a lot of them. In fact, one thing the Jains did which Buddhists didn't do was they kept a census. Right? Interesting. Like the Buddha a few times refers to like how he had a you know, large community and you know so on, but they never actually kept a list. But in the Jains, uh, they actually have a list of the size of the number of monks and nuns and laymen and lay women. Yeah. Uh, I'm like I'm not sure how historically accurate it is, but they have that list. And what, one of the interesting things about that is that uh, invariably the number of nuns is greater than the number of monks. Yeah. Interesting, right? <laughs> you mean how what percentage is more no, Mike Simmons? The present day? I'm not sure actually. Yeah. I have to have a look. I mean, usually, you know, in the traditional list, you know, there's usually maybe twice as many nuns as monks. But of course, these days, there's not many either monks or nuns in Jainism. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. But only for the uh, ascetics, right? So for the Jain lay people, uh, just like people, right? I mean, it's just like Buddhists, yeah? I mean, not every Buddhist is like going up and sitting meditation on the top of a mountain, yeah? They're just people. And th one of the things that happened, one of, the, one of the ways that Jainism developed a little bit differently to Buddhism is because the uh, ascetic path in Jainism is so harsh, right? It means you've always had a relatively small Sangha. Yeah? And to fill that gap, they develop a class of lay ministers and teachers. Yeah? Uh, so a bit like maybe our Anagarikas or something like that. We have some equivalents in certain parts of Buddhism, but not as established as they did then. And so that lay teacher class was responsible for them for doing the rituals and the, the education and so on for, for most people throughout the villages and so on in Jainism. Yeah. And so the ascetics were tended to be more aloof and they wouldn't wouldn't take part in that too much. Yeah. Um, yes, a houseless monk would not desire women. He should turn away from females learning thoroughly the law. A monk should strictly keep its rules. This law was taught by Kapila of pure knowledge. Those who follow it will be saved and will gain both worlds. This world and the next world, thus I say. So, uh, this is just one, uh, one text, just a kind of a sample text. Uh, and I might just uh, read another one so we just get a couple of points of view. Um, Go on, please. Right. Right. 
right? Yes, yeah, and I mean this, these kinds of questions were raised by the Buddha in the suttas, yeah. He said if, if, if this um, pain was caused by the creation of God, then he must be a cruel God, yeah. Uh, but if it's caused by yourself, then aren't you being cruel by creating that pain, yeah. So definitely it's, 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 a, you know, it's an active question, yeah. Okay, oh, look, I'm just going to read through this one kind of another short text. This is from the same text, but a different passage from it. Uh, and we'll just sort of see what it says. Just to get a, just, I'm just trying to give like a different feel for some of the different aspects of the philosophy. So this one is on the four requisites. Of course, we also have four requisites in Buddhism. Let's see if they're the same thing. Four things of paramount value are difficult to obtain here by a living being. Human birth, instruction in the law, belief in it, and energy in self-control. Okay. The universe is peopled by manifold creatures who are in this samsara born in different families and castes for having undergone various actions. Sometimes they go to the world of the gods, sometimes in the hells. Sometimes they become asuras in accordance with their actions. Sometimes they become kshatriyas or chandalas or pukasas or worms or moths or insects called guntu or ants, thus be living beings of sinful actions who are born again and again in ever-recurring births are not disgusted with samsara, but they're like warriors who are never tired of the battle of life. Living beings bewildered through the influence of their actions, distressed and suffering pains, undergo misery in non-human births. But by the cessation of karma, perchance living beings will reach in due time a pure state and be reborn as men. Okay, so the first one is that's sort of the difficulty of being reborn in the human state. Second one, though they've been reborn with the human state, it will be difficult for them to hear the Dhamma, having heard which they will do penances, combat their passions and abstain from killing living beings. So again, so see how that, that precept on abstaining from living beings is so central. You know, it's all the time constantly being repeated. But of course, they have other precepts as well, but this one is so central. The third one, though by chance they may hear the law, it will be the Dhamma, it will be difficult for them to believe in it. Many who are shown the right way will stray from it. And though they may have heard the Dhamma and believe in it, it is difficult for them to fulfill it strenuously. Many who approve of the religion do not adopt it. Having been born as a man, having heard the law, believing in it and fulfilling it strenuously, an ascetic should restrain himself and shake off sinfulness. Again, this kind of metaphor, that, that dhuta is the shaking off. Right? So the dhuta is like that, that your soul is intrinsically pure and you have to shake off and get rid of the karma or the asava that is polluting it. The pious obtain purity, the pure stand firmly in the dhamma, the soul afterwards reaches the highest nirvana, being like unto a fed with ghee. So the soul, the jiva, reaches nirvana. Leave off the causes of sin, acquire fame through patience. A man who acts up to this will rise to the upper regions, having left his body of clay. Again, this is a, a kind of part of the metaphor that they use, that when you become liberated, it's almost like you float upwards out of your body and your purified soul will ascend and there's a chatra, an umbrella, that covers the whole world and all the purified souls will ascend and they kind of buzz around like fireflies under the chapter, just knowing everything forever. Something like that. The yakshas who are gifted with various virtues live in the heavenly region situated one above the other, shining forth like the great luminaries and hoping never to descend thence. Intent on enjoying divine pleasures and changing their form at will, they live in the upper kalpa heavens for many centuries or former years. But then they, at the end of their life, they expire and they're reborn as men. So again, that same idea that even those who are born in different realms and even the gods and so on will be reborn in the human realm eventually. <clears throat> men are of ten kinds, fields and houses, golden cattle, slaves and servants, where these four goods, the four causes of pleasure are present in such families he is born. He will have friends and relations with a good family, a fine complexion, healthy, wise, noble, famous and powerful. Having enjoyed at their proper time the unrivaled pleasures of human life, he will obtain pure no true knowledge by his pure religious merit acquired in a former life. Perceiving that these four requisites are difficult to obtain, he will apply himself to self-control. And when by penances he has shaken off the remnant of karma, he will become an eternal siddha, uh, an eternal purified one. So again, just to sort of illustrate, so again, with that, that, that idea of those four uh, things so to be to be born in the human realm to hear the teaching to have faith in the teaching and to practice the teaching Actually same in Buddhism, right? It's just the same 
but the specific details of how they talk about it, a little bit different. So uh, this is the uh, James. Okay, so questions? We're going to look after the, after in the afternoon, we'll look at how um, the Buddha drew upon some of those teachings. But yes, Ling? Right. Them, yeah. You are less responsible. You know, you are just very small. Not not as with the men that is actually less responsible. Oh, okay. And and you know, therefore, you know, you will actually have to start with you know, free of um, you know, and get the fire or or those hell 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 things. Is that is there any chance in my mind that I'm thinking that they actually read the wrong sutra, they read the wrong sutra? <laughs> Um, well, um, I, 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 <laughs> I think it's, it's doubtful if the Lao monks are actually reading Jain sutras, um, but uh, what can I say, misogyny is universal and one of those things that you find everywhere, unfortunately, and it seeps into Buddhism uh, just as it seeps into Jainism and Brahmanism, yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, I, again, I, without, I don't want to apologize for these things uh, in any way, but I think it's also true, like as we we're saying, that there were many of the women who were going forth in the Jain religion and so on. And these things are always complicated, you know? They're never as one sided as you might see. Yeah. But do you, do you want to know what I think? If I think, if I hear a monk who's always banging on about how bad women are and how they're a temptation and things, I always think he's telling me a lot more about himself than he is about the women. <laughs> yeah. There's a sutra in the Anguttara Nikaya where the, um, uh, the Buddha is asked, you know, when, what, how do you, you know, if when I go uh, among the women, then I've, sometimes I feel desire, what do I do? And the Buddha says, well, you look at the women who are your own age and see them as your sister. And younger women see them as your daughter, older women see them as your mother. Yeah. Yes? Ah, oh, the Panchavagya? Most likely, yeah. Certainly very similar to Jane's, right? Um, Right, exactly. And I mean, even in, in the Deer Park now, there is a Jain temple. So, yeah, it's likely that that was there from the beginning. I mean, it's called the Isipatana, right? The, the sages drop in place. So where the sages drop by. Same person, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure why the difference in naming, but it's just a, often, often these people would be known by different titles and things. Yeah. I mean, Nigata Nataputra is just a, just a um, title, really. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Niganta means um, bondless. Ganta is a tie or a bond, so Niganta means free of unattached. Unattached Nataputra is just the, the, the dancer's son. So why do you think people are so interested in all of these self-mortification things? Why do people like to do it? Like it has this fascination, you know? Like even when we're driving around in, in uh, around near Jaffna, 
you see these guys doing this, you're like, what? Some, some of these that's like really kind of challenging, right? You look at it and you think, you think these people are really other. It's like so weird. Like, why would you do that? Right, yeah. Right. And, and yeah, and you, nev you never think it's going to actually happen. And then it does, yeah. That, I think, the Deepika, that's what you're saying about, like, when they're doing the, 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 that, the thing, that, the, the, the dance, but also the, the, that self-modification, that often it's fulfilling a vow, is that right? Yeah. 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 Right. Which one? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Anthony Robbins says for fire walking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they do fire walking. But fire walking is a bit of a con, though, I think. Like, I don't know if that's a real aesthetic practice. No. Yeah. Because I think, I think that just like the, it's just, it's just the, the physics of it. It's just the physics of it, yeah, because you have like the sweat on your feet and then it evaporates and then you've, you're, the, the, the things are hard. But then people often get burns, but it's only afterwards that you actually feel the burns. Yeah. So, so but anyway, but it's the same thing, right? You're forging like a group identity, right? We're all kind of really tough because we're doing this crazy thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And there's 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 like a power in that, you know. I think it's this, these things. It's really is. It's really like like the mythologically when they talk about the ascetics in the, in the Hindu myths doing these things. You know, there'll always be some ascetic who's like standing on one leg for a hundred years or a thousand years or something, and then the throne of Saka will get hot, or the throne of Indra will get hot, and then Indra can't stay on his throne anymore. You know, so you're like overthrowing the gods because of the power that you're developing. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, that's true. That is also true. Yeah, yeah. They would do. They would do things like um, living on poles was one they would do. Um, uh, but even even a friend of mine who was a Buddhist monk was formerly a Christian monk, a Catholic monk. Uh, Catholic, yeah, Catholic monk. And he used to do. They used to do self-flagellation in that particular sect. So they would like whip themselves with iron things in the whips. Yeah, I said, why would you do that? He said, well, I know it's just like they were doing it, right? It was just the thing to do, you know? And they're just like, they're supposed to think of the suffering that Jesus went through and the suffering all beings that weren't going through and so on. So I'm like, okay. But then they would have a glass of wine afterwards, so they'd feel better. <laughs> Right, 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 yeah, yeah, to be able to just say I did it, right, yeah, it gives you a sense of self, like it, it gives you a sense of like who, who you are, right, you can define your, your sense of self in terms of what you've achieved, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I mean, there's something kind of, you know, weirdly, like I find those things really interesting because on the one hand, it's just so bizarre, but on the other hand, it's kind of weirdly relatable. Uh, anyway. I mean, it's not, yeah, not dissimilar to like, you know, a lot of extreme diets and things like that people do today, purge their bodies of toxins and so on. Yeah. <laughs> like Jordan Peterson springs to mind. Who, if you haven't heard of Jordan Peterson, you probably don't want to, but anyway, he, um, uh, ex professor of psychology, but he was kind of a, became a kind of internet guru and, um, decided that having a diet, he's very kind of pro, kind of masculine. And he decided to have a diet of purely beef. That's it. Just a beef only diet. Yeah, he ended up in a coma for like three months. So, uh, yeah, same kind of thing, right? Extreme, extremes. Right? Yeah, definitely. And I think this is something that's kind of un under-examined, right? Um, they have, there's been some... Um, some discussion of that in Western monasticism and looking at like the relationship between mental illness and a lot of kind of extreme religious practices and so on. And I don't, I'm not aware of that work being done in India and in Indian tradition, but I wouldn't be surprised if you'd find similar kinds of correlations, right? I mean, they're, they're, these are ex sometimes really extreme behaviors and you've got to ask yourself what drives you to that? Um, and not to say that it, you know, has to be associated with that, but I mean, in a way, in, in, in a way, um, how do I put this? In a way, like in culture, people who have mental illnesses are often kind of seen as being somehow like savants or holy or touched by God or something like that, you know? Maybe you're like speaking in tongues or you're seeing visions and all these kinds of things. And we might look at it and say that it's a symptom of a mental illness, but somebody else might look at it and say that it's a sign that they've had an encounter with God, you know, and your mind can't stand it because God's too much, yeah? And that's why they're like that, yeah. I mean, I, what I'm kind of hesitating with, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether... Um, I'm wondering whether you could even see it as being healthy in that response. I mean, at least you know, you're doing these crazy things, but at least you're accepted to do that. You know? You've got a community. It could be worse. Yeah? yeah. Anyway. Okay, everybody, let's um, uh, break up and uh, go and have some lunch. And we'll be back here for the uh, group discussion session at 2 o'clock. <laughs> uh, sorry? Microphone, right. So. Okay. Um, Five o'clock, right. Two, six, thirty. Okay. Oops, there it is.
Right. So uh, for the final uh, session for today, uh, we are going to look at one of the uh, suttas where the Buddha talks about his former practice uh, when he was uh, an ascetic. So this is Madhya Nikaya number 36, the Mahasachaka Sutta. Uh, it's quite a long sutta. Usually most of, most of the time on this course I'm trying to give shortish suttas to assign, but this one is a longish one. Um, and just a bit of uh, background. So uh, in the suttas we find... Um, like, we don't find uh, a, a lot of the suttas where the Buddha was talking about his own life and his own biography. Okay, for people get ready. Yeah. Okay, are we good? So we don't find in suttas a lot of times where the Buddha's talking about his own biography. Uh, most of the time, he just taught the Dhamma or just responded to people. And this is very, actually very realistic. Because if you think about in your life, how much of your life do you spend talking about your life? Not that much, occasionally, from time to time. But usually your own life isn't particularly interesting because, well, you lived it, you were there, and you know what happened. So uh, that makes the few discourses where the Buddha does talk about his own life and practice even more valuable. And so there are some of those passages which are very um, important and very central, uh, especially those which detail the Buddha's practice before he was enlightened. And we know that he spent a period of six years uh, striving to become awakened, searching, trying different uh, teachings and practices. Um, and most of those suttas that talk about the Buddha's early practice are found in the Madhyama Nikaya. Uh, and there's probably half a dozen or so suttas that are very important in that regard, and this is one of them. So let's have a look at the Mahasachaka Sutta. So I have heard, at one time the Buddha was staying near Vesali, the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. Uh, and Vesali, uh, we should remember, is, to, is part of the main area that the Buddha travelled in, and it's to the north of the Ganges, uh, just north of um, Pat modern-day Patna. Um, now at that time in the morning, the Buddha, being properly dressed, took his bowl and robe, wished, wishing to enter Vesali for alms. Then, as Sachika, the son of Jain parents, was looking, going for a walk, he approached the hall with a peaked roof in the great, uh, the great uh, wood. Venerable Ananda saw him coming off in the distance and said to the Buddha, Sir Sachika, the son of Jain parents, is coming. He's a debater and a clever speaker regarded as holy by many people. He wants to discredit the Buddha, the teaching, and the Sangha. Please, sir, sit for a moment out of compassion. The Buddha sat on the seat, set out. Then Sachika went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, he sat down to one side and said to the Buddha, Master Gotama, so in the suttas, this form of address, Master Gotama, Bho Gotama, is a um, polite but not very polite form of address. Right? So he's being civil, but he's certainly not being reverent. Yeah? Bho Gotama, Master Gotama, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who live committed to the practice of developing physical endurance without developing the mind. Now, kaya bhavana yoga, yoga mana yutta viharante, no chitta bhavana. So, kaya bhavana, but not chitta bhavana. They suffer painful physical feelings. This happened to someone once. Their thighs became paralyzed, their heart burst, hot blood gushed from their mouth, and they went mad and lost their mind. Doesn't sound good, does it? Their mind was subject to the body and the body had power over it. Yeah? Chitta kepang. They lost their mind. Because, why is that? Because their mind was not developed. Yeah? There are some ascetics and Brahmins who live committed to the practice. And again, just notice in passing, okay? So um, this phrase, samana brahmana, 
is used of, as a very general term for any kind of religious or spiritual practitioner. But you know, notice how even in this you know, quite early times, uh, you know, these practices might have been done by Brahmins or they might have been done by Samanas, actually. Yeah? They're actually both doing much of the same practices many times. So the Samba ascetics and Brahmins who live committed to the practice of developing the mind without developing physical endurance. They suffer pain. So, so the word I've translated here is developing physical endurance. The Pali is actually just kaya bhavana, right? The development of the body, literally the development of the body. But if you say development of the body without understanding, it's, it's, it's not really clear exactly what it means. But clearly from the context, what it means, what kaya bhavana means, is physical endurance. They suffer painful mental feelings. Jetasikang dukkang vedanam. This happened to someone once. Their thighs became paralyzed, their heart burst, hot blood gushed from their mouth, and they went mad and lost their mind. The body was subject to the mind, and the mind had power over it. Why was that? Because their physical endurance was not developed. It occurs to me that Master Gautama's disciples must live committed to the practice of developing the mind without developing physical endurance. All right? So this is the, this is the, the Buddha's getting this challenge. All right? And so... Now, first of all, um, let's just again take a step back and apply what we've learned about uh, the culture and so on at the time. Now, we know that it is characteristic of the Jains that they, their practice is more physical, right? It's about self-torment and so on, and about purifying through tapas the soul or the jiva, yeah? And so that's why they do all of that practice. But what he's saying here, and what he's suggesting, is that if you try to do all of that physical self-torment and you haven't developed your mind, then you're going to go mad. Not an unreasonable position, right? So he's suggesting that actually you have to develop the mind and the body uh, together. Again, not an unreasonable position. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that the, the practice of self-torment itself was unreasonable, but generally he's saying that if you're going to do these practices, it has to be a balance of both mental and physical development. So in this way, you know, Jainism is actually almost like a halfway house where it's kind of developing towards that more Buddhist influence on, em emphasis on the mind. It's not purely just the physical endurance, but they're also having an understanding of mental development as well. Now, the criticism of the Buddha, again, is not entirely unfounded because it is very much the case in Buddhism that the Buddha talked about citta bhavana all the time, right? But he didn't really talk about kaya bhavana, right? Kaya bhavana is not really a term in Buddhism. Citta bhavana, yes, all the time. So, so he's making this criticism, right? And, you know, clearly he wants to sort of attack uh, the Buddha, um, but he does so in quite an quite a, um, educated and reasonable way, right? He's not just abusing the Buddha, he's not just insulting him, he's using quite a, um, quite a sophisticated uh, a critique. Yeah? And as always, when the Buddha was challenged like this, he was okay with it. He didn't mind, it's all right, yeah? You can make these challenges, the Buddha will respond in his own way. Let's see how the Buddha responded. Uh, but, Agivesana, uh, what have you heard about the development of physical endurance? Okay. Again, notice the manner of the Buddha's response. Right? Again, this is what I was saying right at the beginning, that it's very different when you read from the suttas to when you read a book about Buddhism. A book about Buddhism will tell you what the Buddha taught. But here, you're seeing how the Buddha responded to that person, okay? So Satchika, whose family name is Agivesana, comes and he asks this question, which on the one hand, it's quite an intelligent question, quite a sophisticated question, but on the other hand, obviously has a somewhat aggressive intent, right? The Buddha's response in this case, put it back to him, yeah? Well, what do you really mean by Kaya Bhavana? Make no mistake, Okay? The Buddha is setting him up. Okay? The Buddha knows what he's doing. Yeah? So he's carefully laying his trap. Yeah? 
So we'll see how this goes. So in this case, this is one of the uh, kinds of ways of responding to a question. So sometimes you respond to a question with a direct answer, sometimes with a patipucha, by asking a question in return, sometimes by analysis, sometimes by tapania, by setting a question aside. This kind by, a, by a, a response. Take, for example, Nandavacha Kisa Sankicha and Makkali Gosala. Now these are three uh, ascetic leaders who are spoken of in the Pali Canon. Nandavacha and Kisa Sankicha are very obscure characters. We don't really know much about them, uh, apart from these few mentions. Makkali Gosala is a little bit better known. Makkali Gosala was originally a, um, a colleague of Mahavira or Nigatanataputta. They practiced together in the early years. Uh, and uh, then they had a falling out. And sort of there's various legends about what they had a falling out about or something like that. But Makkali Gosala uh, ended up forming his own uh, sect, which is known as the Ajivakas. And uh, the uh, Ajivakas were one of the major Samana movements at the time of the Buddha. Probably the, after Buddhism and Jainism, Ajivakism probably the, the third most popular. Uh, and Ajivakas uh, lasted for some time because we know that King Ashoka made offerings of to Ajivaka ascetics. Uh, so they were around for some time. Uh, and Purely as a matter of Australian pride, uh, if you want to know more about the Ajivikas, the classic textbook was by Basham, written while at the ANU in Canberra. So there you go. Um, and he did, a, uh, well, I can't remember his first name, but Basham was a professor up at ANU. Uh, and in those days, we had one of the best uh, Indic studies departments in the world. And that was, um, he did a really excellent job because you have to pull so many bits and pieces to try to learn anything about the Ajivikas because we don't have anything from their tradition. And uh, he did a really excellent job. Anyway, one of the passages here. They go naked, ignoring conventions. They lick their hands. Okay? I don't know why. Don't ask me about that. Why are they licking their hands? I don't know. They don't come or wait when called. All right? So this is na ehi badantika, na tikta badantika. So uh, what that means is that when you're walking on arms round, that you just walk slowly through the village, and if someone says, oh, please wait for a moment, I'll get some food, you just ignore them and you keep going. All right? Na ehi badantika. They don't uh, take consent to food brought to them, or food prepared on purpose for them, uddisakatang, or an invitation for a meal. They don't receive anything from a pot or a bowl, or from someone who keeps sheep, okay? Or someone who has a weapon or a shovel in their home. So some of these are a bit obscure, right? Why are these? And this, 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 some of these are they're very difficult uh, kind of translations. Erlaka mantarang, okay. Someone who keeps sheep. Danda mantarang, so someone who has a danda. You could translate danda as a staff or something like that, but I think it means if they have a weapon. Musala, a pestle or a shovel. Hmm. I think it means a shovel. Because why? Because uh, for the Jains, the earth was a living organism. So somebody who has a shovel in their home is someone who kills the earth by digging it. I think, but it's just a guess, okay? Yeah, some of these very obscure. Uh, where a couple is eating, where there is a woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding, or who has a man in her home, or where there's a dog waiting or flies buzzing. They ex so, there's not a lot of places that you can go for arms once you've ruled out all of those places. They accept no fish or meat or liquor or wine and drink no beer. All right. Um, 
again, so many of these things are, are very uh, interesting translation challenges. I won't go into all of them, but just mention that uh, it's interesting that they accept no fish or meat. Um, it seems that the Jains were not vegetarian at the time, uh, but they had a rule which was similar to the Buddhist rule, which is that you shouldn't eat meat that is prepared on purpose for you. Yeah? But these ascetics would not exceed any meat at all. all right? um, any questions about these before I go on? Yeah. Sorry? Ah. <laughs> Is beer or wine uh, around at the time? Uh, now, now, fish or meat or liquor or, or wine. So, surang uh, liquor. Um, meraya. Yeah, meraya. Yeah. Some kind of alcohol. Some kind of alcohol. Not exactly sure what it's made from, but it may have been like a wine from fermented fruit. Something like that. Uh, and then tusodakang. Um, uh, tusodakang is like from a, it's a, it's a alcoholic drink from a fermented grain. So, yes, yeah, something like beer. Yeah. Beer is very old. Yeah. Do you know beer built the pyramids? Yes. <laughs> right? Would be good at, right? right? So, this is what they, and they fed the workers in e ancient Egypt was a fermented. Like, almost like a gruel, fermented gruel. Yeah, it's an interesting question because it's not... It, yes, it was there from the early times. And you can see here, like, the, you know, even the pre-Buddhist ascetics would keep that rule about not drinking alcohol, definitely. But it's not always there in the list of precepts when the Buddha's talking about it. It wasn't systematized quite so regularly as you find it today. Uh, so I think maybe, maybe it's been, it was made a little bit more prominent as time went on, but it certainly was there from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so accepting no alcohol. Um, so there's a, in the Vinaya, there's a story about why the monks shouldn't eat, shouldn't drink alcohol. And uh, so one of the monks uh, was very renowned for his uh, psychic powers. And what, what did he do? He had a psychic power where he overcome, overcame the, the uh, fire of a naga or something like that. And then he, the lay people offered him alcohol to drink. And so he got drunk and was laying there sprawling out. And the Buddha said, now he couldn't even win a battle with a salamander, much <laughs> less with a naga. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, moving on. So they go to just one house for arms, taking just one mouthful, or two houses and two mouthfuls, up to seven houses and seven mouthfuls. They feed on one saucer a day, two saucers a day, up to seven saucers a day. They eat once a day, once every second day, once a week, and so on, even up to once a fortnight. They live committed to the practice of eating food at set intervals. All right? Uh, so, of course, these are all practices revolving around uh, arms round. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, the kind of the making of vows, right? So when we talk about sila bata, right? So the bata is a vow that you would make, and so they would make some kind of vow. Say, so, okay, we're only, I'm only going to go to one house for alms uh, every day, and so you go to that one house, and they maybe give you like a lump of rice or something. So often, like. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, traditionally, when you would go for arms, then you wouldn't get like a whole meal or anything like that. You would just get a spoonful of rice, yeah, usually. So you take your arms around, and they would give you a spoonful of rice at each house, and you might have to go to many houses before you had enough to eat. Because the families didn't have very much, yeah, but they would give what they have. And it's the same thing in Thailand, especially in rural Thailand, when you go for Pindabata today. So when we would go to the villages in northeast Thailand, uh, you know, each, each home would give like one, one little lump of sticky, sticky rice, 
and the villagers would line up on the road and they would just give one little lump. Sometimes they would give you something if they had it. They might give you a banana or some sweets or some curry if they had it. But often they'd just give one little lump of rice. So to eat from just one house a day would be a challenge. Yeah? It doesn't mean like having one full meal a day, right? It means having a spoonful of rice, maybe a bit of dal if you're lucky. But Agivesana, do they get by on so little? No, Master Gotama. Sometimes they eat a variety of luxury foods and drink a variety of luxury beverages. They gather their body strength, build it up, and get fat. What they earlier gave up, they later got back. That is how there is the increase and decrease of the, this body, says the Buddha. So uh, this is the Buddha's sense of humor coming through here. Very deadpan, right? <laughs> Very dry sense of humor. Ah, oh, yes, so whoever gave up, they later got back. That is how there is the increase and decrease of this body. So the Buddha didn't have... So this, again, is one of the things the Buddha... You know, what the Buddha is talking about when he's talking about these vows, right? Sila Bhatta. Taking vows and undertaking them for the sake of them is not really achieving anything. Only, often, in fact, all it does is inflame your ego. Yeah? And you're the one who does those vows. And is it actually doing anything for your long-term spiritual development? And the Buddha is saying, well, this is what they do. They just do this. Early you gave up, they later got back. So the Buddha always, again, this is an aspect of the middle way. The Buddha is always like, take small steps. Gradually, gradually, gradually keep getting better. All right. But Agivesana, what have you heard about the development of the mind? When Satchika was questioned by the Buddha about development of the mind, he was stumped. Again, interesting and, and very kind of, I think, very precise. So again, if you notice that I mentioned before with the Jains, that they're mainly emphasizing these physical practices and so on, but they do kind of sort of mention meditation from time to time, right? But they don't really have much to say about it. And if you look in the Jain Sutras, they don't really tell you how to meditate or they don't like give you all the, you know, the hindrances and the meditation methods and all of those things that we find in the Buddhist texts. Yeah? So this actually is a very realistic response from, from Satchika. Right? He's saying, oh yes, we have development of the mind, but he can't really say what that development of the mind is. Yeah? Um, so, you know, I, I think the, these things are important because these are little details that... To me, they show how uh, you know, so many of the things we see in the suttas that we might take for granted, uh, but they're actually like very precise and very carefully phrased. So, so Satchika has some kind of idea about this idea of development of the body in terms of the physical deprivation, but he really can't say anything about development of the mind. And so the Buddha's... Um, uh, uh, rather than sort of refuting Satchika outright, then he want, turned the question back, got him to try to defend himself and explain really what he meant. Uh, and then that's where he were, got stumped. So, the Buddha went on. <clears throat> the Buddha said to Satchika, the development of physical endurance that you have described is not the legitimate development of physical endurance in the noble one's training. training huh? Uh, so, uh, legitimate development, dhammika kaya bhavana, uh, in the aryasa vinaya, the noble one's training. And since you don't even understand the development of physical endurance, how can you possibly understand the development of the mind? Still, as to how someone is developed, undeveloped in physical endurance and mind, and how someone is developed in physical endurance and mind, listen and play close, pay close attention, I will speak. Yes, sir, said Satchika. The Buddha said this. How is someone undeveloped in physical endurance and mind? Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to, again, just pause and uh, note about the form of the sutta. All right? So we've, we've seen uh, some of the... Uh, earlier today, we saw some of the Upanishads. We saw some of the Jain suttas. And it's interesting when we compare the styles, because I noted that you know, there are a lot of those similarities. Okay? But there's also a, a great difference. The Buddha was much more organized in his thinking. Right? And this pattern that he's talking about is a pattern that he uses again and again. It's easy to overlook it because it's so common. 
Yeah? He knew exactly what he was doing right from the beginning. Satchika comes and issues this challenge. The Buddha responds with the counter question. Then he shows oh, that understanding is inadequate. Then he says, okay, now I will give you the answer. Yeah? Then he's outlining, this is the answer to this question, this is the answer to that question. Everything is very, very systematic. And so this clarity of presentation is, how, uh, is, is, is very characteristic of specifically the Buddha's teachings. You don't find that in the Upanishads and so on. Uh, and apart from, you know, obviously is, a, is a exhibiting the Buddha's clarity of mind, right? He knew what he was doing but also is showing how these texts are designed for the oral tradition, right? Because they're constantly repeating these bits. This is this bit, this is that bit. Now we'll do this bit, now we'll do that bit. And these are all telling you how the text is formed and they're guiding you through it and they're guiding your memory, okay? And when you're reciting these things, all of these little bits are very, very helpful because you're told at the beginning, oh, there are these three things. Okay, great, three things. And you keep chanting as one thing, yes, then there's two. Hang on, wasn't there? There was three things. There's got to be one more. I've forgotten one. Ah, oh, yeah, then there's that one more thing. So these things are always there to help you, um, help you learn. All right. How is someone undeveloped in physical endurance and mind take an uneducated, ordinary person who has a pleasant feeling? Mmm, nice. When they experience pleasant feeling, they become full of lust for it then that pleasant feeling ceases. When it ceases, a painful feeling arises. When they suffer a painful feeling, they sorrow and wail and lament, beating their breast and falling into confusion. Because their physical endurance is undeveloped, pleasant feelings occupy the mind. And because their mind is undeveloped, painful feelings occupy the mind. Ah, oh dear. Someone whose mind is occupied by both pleasant and painful feelings like this is undeveloped in physical endurance and in mind. And how is someone developed in physical endurance and mind take an educated, noble disciple who has a pleasant feeling? When they experience a pleasant feeling, they don't become full of lust for it. Then that pleasant feeling ceases. And when it ceases, painful feeling arises. When they suffer painful feelings, they don't sorrow or wail or lament, beating their breast and falling into confusion. Because their physical endurance is developed, pleasant feelings don't occupy the mind. And because their mind is developed, painful feelings don't occupy their mind. Okay, so... Um, uh, someone whose mind is not occupied by both pleasant and painful feelings like this is developed both in, in physical endurance and in mind. Okay, so uh, one... Uh, interesting point here is the Buddha is showing that uh, even somebody who is enlightened will still experience those painful feelings. So it's not as if you don't suffer pain, but that you don't let it occupy your mind. All right. Sachika, obviously impressed. I'm quite confident. Evang pasanno ahang. I'm quite confident that Master Gotama is developed in physical endurance and in mind. Your words are clearly invasive and intrusive, Agivesana. Nevertheless, I will answer you. Okay? Why? Because he was, Agivesana was making assumptions about the Buddha's spiritual practice. Yeah? And this is something which, as a monk uh, or as a nun, we have to be very careful with because if we make a false claim about our spiritual practice, then it can be what they call a parajika offense. So we can uh, immediately, if, as soon as you do that, as soon as you say you know, you're enlightened or something like that, if you're not, if you're lying about it, you immediately you're not a monk or you're not a nun, right? That's it. And you can never be for the rest of this life. Uh, no, 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 nothing. That's it. You're finished. So that's bad, right? And so when, that, but that's a false claim. Right? If it's a true claim, okay, it still shouldn't do it, but it's not a Parajika offense. Okay? So if you really are sort of telling the truth about it, then uh, generally speaking, we don't, we don't do that. It's still a, vineyard, a minor vineyard offense. But, um, so this is why that kind of thing. And like culturally, um, kind of culturally, it's a kind of thing that when people say that kind of thing, Sometimes they're fishing for a response. 
you know? They'll say something to you, and they're like, oh, they're, they're, they're hoping to, oh, you know, oh, yes, oh, you must, you must, you know, you must be very highly attained meditator or something like that. And they're kind of looking for you to, to confirm it or to give them something like that. So this is why the Buddha said, no, that's not an appropriate question. Nevertheless, I will answer you. <clears throat> Ever since I shaved off my hair and beard, dressed in ochre robes, and went forth from the lay life to homelessness, it has not been possible for any pleasant or painful feeling to occupy my mind. Powerful words, yeah? Even, even before he was enlightened, right? Even before he was enlightened, he still didn't allow the pain, pleasant and painful feelings to, uh, to distress him like that. See if I can get the... Um Oh, there we go. Uh, cancel, cancel, cancel. We good? We good. Agivasana finds it difficult to believe. Surely you must have had feelings so pleasant or so painful that they could ask that they that they could occupy your mind. How could I not, Agivasana? Before my awakening, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening. So this is a phrase we find in the suttas: Anabhi sambuddhasa pubeva sambodha. And I'll be some buddhasa bodhisattvasa eva sato. So what this means is before uh, I was enlightened, before the sambodhi, and I'll be unenlightened, bodhisattva. Yeah? So the word bodhisattva in Pali uh, is... Uh, the word, word bodhisattva in Pali can have two senses or two meanings. The more common meaning that people know is equivalent to the Sanskrit bodhisattva, right? The bodhisattva meaning enlightenment being. But enlightenment being is an odd compound, and the exact meaning of it is a bit obscure. Another word that bodhisattva can mean in Pali is bodhisakta, which means one intent on enlightenment. Yeah? And that fits the context that we find this used in Pali much better because it's usually used in, pa in the suttas uh, of the bodhisattva after he has left home and when he was seeking enlightenment. So this is exactly the context here. Yeah, he's still unawakened but intent on awakening. Yeah? So this is why I think to translate it as the bodhisattva. Again, it's, it's, uh, sorry, as, one intent, as if it's bodhisattva, so one intent on awakening. So this is a good example of why it's important, I think, to translate everything. It's, it's tempting to leave bodhisattva there uh, untranslated because everybody knows what a bodhisattva is. But when people think of what a bodhisattva is, what they think is it means somebody, you can look it up on Google, it means somebody who sets aside their own enlightenment for the sake of others. That's what people think bodhisattva is. I could probably find it on Google right now. Um, but let's see what Google says a bodhisattva is. Uh, we're going, right. Bodhisattva. A bodhisattva, a person who is uh, able to reach nirvana but delays doing so through compassion for suffering beings. Right? So this is what people will think that it means, okay? Uh, now, obviously, that sense has evolved from the sense we find here in the suttas. But in the suttas, it means somebody who's dedicated to enlightenment, somebody who's intent on enlightenment. All right. Living in a house is cramped and dirty, but the life of one gone forth is wide open. It's not easy for someone living at home to leave, lead the spiritual life utterly full and pure like a polished shell. Notice he doesn't say it's impossible. Huh? Naidang Sukarang. Why don't I shave off my hair and beard, dress in ochre robes, and go forth from the lay life into homelessness? Sometime later, while still black haired, blessed with youth in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, dressed in ochre robes, and went forth from the lay life to homelessness. Once I had gone forth, I set out to discover what is skillful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. King Kusala Gavesi. Yeah? And this is the, the, um, the Bodhisattva's uh, spiritual quest. King Kusala Gavesi. Literally, literally, king is what? 
kusala is what is good and skillful, gavesi is seeking. Yeah? You could even say gavesi is looking for a cow. I was looking for a good cow. But no, that's not what it means. <laughs> gavesi means to search. Uh, King Kusala. So he's searching for an answer to the question, what is skillful, what is the good? Yeah? Anuttarang santi varapadang pariyesamano. Yeah? Seeking the supreme savior for sublime peace. I approached Alara Kalama and said to him, now again, we don't have really any information about Alara Kalama apart from this passage and a couple of passages uh, occasionally we find uh, elsewhere in the suttas, but really very little. But I think most likely Alara Kalama was a Brahmanical Rishi following the Upanishadic tradition. Reverend Kalama, I wish to lead the spiritual life in this teaching and training. Alara Kalama replied, stay, venerable. This teaching is such that a sensible person can soon realize their own tradition with their own insight and live having achieved it. Okay, so he's, taught, he's saying that this is something you can actually realize and see for yourself. Again, a quality of the Dhamma. Uh, sakang acharya kang. Yeah? Sakang acharya kang. One's own teacher's lineage. I quickly memorized that teaching. Right? So, um, again, this is one of the reasons why I think this, these were Brahmanical teachings because the only scriptures that the suttas talk about is the Brahmanical scriptures. Okay? Maybe the Jains and Ajivikas and others had scriptures. Certainly later they did. At the time of the Buddha, did they or did they not? We don't know, but the Buddha never actually refers to them. The only ones that he refers to are the Vedas and the Brahmanical scriptures. It's when it says here, he went, he joined that tradition, and the first thing, he memorized the teaching. Okay? Must have been learning some Brahmanical scriptures. And as we've seen, uh, that there's many echoes of the uh, Upanishads in the suttas, so maybe that's what he learned there. Unfortunate, right? He should have t told what his, script, his, his curriculum was. Yes, that would have been nice if he had a list of what he was learned, but uh, unfortunately he didn't tell us that. I quickly memorized that teaching. Yeah. Yes, yes, so in those days you would have sat down with the master and the student, and the master would say a line and you would repeat it, and you would do that again until you'd memorize it, and then go on to the next line, and the next line, and the next line. So that was how they passed down the oral tradition. Uh, yeah. Um, so the word pariyaponing, uh, to memorize, so when, one, of, one of the sort of slight or sort of subtle changes that I made in my translation is that in former translations, they might say something like, I quickly learned that teaching, yeah? which is not incorrect, right? It means he learned that teaching, but it doesn't quite give the exact impression of what happened. He actually memorized scriptures. Yeah? He wasn't just going to a class and listening to what they're holding in the class. He's actually memorizing scriptures. Yeah. So as far as lip recital and oral recitation were concerned, I spoke with knowledge and the authority of the elders. The Theravada. Okay? So this is the Theravada. This is what the Brahmins were teaching. So Theravada, of course, the word just literally means like the doctrine or the teaching of the elders. Yeah? So again, uh, just adopted there. I claim to know and see Janami, Pasami, Ti, Pati Janami, and so did others. Okay. Then it occurred to me, it's not solely by mere faith that Alara Kalama declares, I realize this teaching with my own insight and live having achieved it. Sayang abhinya sachi katwa upasampadya viharami. Surely, he meditates knowing and seeing this teaching. Adha, surely. Uh, and this word at the end here, viharati, uh, means literally to dwell or to abide. Right? But we often find it in the suttas to mean to meditate. Right? It's in the jhana formulas, upasampadya viharati, uh, the brahma viharas, in many places. So again, I, I, I often sort of in the context... You can translate either dwell or to meditate. And again, it's one of these things where if you translate it 
I think, too consistently as to dwell, you kind of miss the point, right? He dwells knowing and seeing this teaching. It doesn't really tell you what he's doing, right? But what it actually means, of course, is that he's entering a state of meditation where he can realize this teaching. So I approached Alara Kalama and said to him, Reverend Kalama, to what extent do you say you realize this teaching with your own insight? Yeah? Sayang abhinya satikatwa. When, he, when I said this, he declared the dimension of nothingness, akinchanya yatana. Then it occurred to me, it's not just Alara Kalama who has faith, energy, mindfulness, immersion, and wisdom. I too have these things. We are familiar with these? Yes? Where do we know these from? The five, five indriya, yeah? Five faculties, five indriya, five bala, five powers, yeah? Yes? So, the Buddha, again, very, um, very uh, uh, happy to acknowledge when he got things from somebody else. Right? The Buddha, was, there's nothing to be ashamed of, right? And the Buddha say, oh yeah, he learned these five, five things from these Brahmanical teachers. Oh, okay, no problem. But of course, that doesn't mean that the meaning of them is always exactly the same, right? The general idea is the same. The meaning may be somewhat different. Yeah? Indriyas. Indriyas. You know what I think Indriya really means? Deepika probably knows. What do you think? You're nodding. Indra is the sun. Yes. Okay. 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 Maybe. It wasn't what I was thinking of, but it doesn't sound like a bad uh, explanation. So Indra was the war god of the Vedas. Okay. Now, of course, by the time of the Buddha, he's known as Saka, and he's kind of converted, become much more of a pacifist. He won't even run his chariots over some little birds on the ground. So he's definitely changed his ways from his old warmongering role. But in the old days, he was not to be trifled with. And he would leap into battle full of power, ready to slay his, injury, his enemies. Do you remember we were talking earlier this morning and I talked about the Vedic warriors and how they went into power, they went into battle, and where did they get their power from? From drugs, <laughs> right? From drugs, yes? So they were, they were popping a bit of meth, okay? Which, I mean, you know, it's a kind of open secret. I mean, it's still what armies do today, right? I mean, it's still when people go to war, you know? I mean, the Nazis were famously high on meth the whole time. And a lot of, you know, certainly the American armies and other places, they're taking a lot of drugs, right? I mean, you've got to stay awake. So this is what they're doing. So, and from the usage in the Rig Veda, right, what, the, what you do is you have your Indra, then you take your Soma, and then that manifests your Indriya. Yeah? Your Indriya being like the Indraness of Indra, the power of the powerful one. Yeah? So this is how you're manifesting. So you have this innate power, and then you manifest that and bring that forth. And this is what I think the real meaning of the word Indriya is in Buddhism, not the drugs part, right? But through meditation, that you are manifesting and expanding that power and that capacity that you naturally have. Yeah? So we have these abilities, faith, energy, mindfulness, immersion, wisdom, and that, and, but the Indriya of them is we have expanded them, we have developed them, we have grown them so that they're filled and charged with power. And that's how they can vanquish the enemies of greed, hatred, and delusion. So again, this is how the Buddha is always adapting the language from uh, around him. All right, so Bodhisattva is going, okay, I have these things, good. Why don't I make an effort to realize the same teaching uh, that Alara Kalama says he has realized with his own insight? Uh, 
Notice the word to make an effort is padaheya, to strive. Uh, and we have the famous Padana Sutta in the Sutta Nipata talking about this practice of striving before his enlightenment as well. I quickly realized that teaching with my own insight and lived having achieved it. All right? So, look, he's a very quick study. Yeah? He went along, learnt all the scriptures, okay, master the Vedas, whatever. Now, coming along meditating, quickly I learnt that. Ah, just the dimension of nothingness, okay? <laughs> Boop, there we go, okay. I approached Lara Kalama and said to him, Reverend Kalama, have you realised this teaching with your own insight up to this point and declare having achieved it? I have, Reverend. I too have realized this teaching with my own insight up to this point and live having achieved it. We are fortunate, Reverend, so very fortunate to see a venerable such as yourself as one of our spiritual companions. So the teaching that I've realized with my own insight, you've realized with your own insight, the teaching you've realized, I've realized, the teaching I know, you know, the teaching you know, I know, I am like you and you are like me. Come now, Reverend, we should both lead this community together. Remember when the Buddha uh, became enlightened and the first thing that he thought was, who shall I share this Dhamma with? And his first thought was, I should share it with Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramputta. Yeah? And this is why. Yeah? Because not only had they uh, attained this very high level of meditation, but you can see he has this humility. Yeah? Such humility to say somebody has realized the same as me, okay, good, we lead the community together. Not even a hesitation. So it's, again, I think it's interesting, it's important to notice that when in the suttas, when the Buddha was encountering and dealing with the people from the different religions, it's not black and white. Yeah? Sometimes the Buddha would criticize some things they would say, sometimes he would endorse it, sometimes he would adopt it, sometimes he would praise it. It depends. The Buddha was a teacher of analysis. Okay? He would use his discretion and his discernment. Yeah? But clearly, he had a lot of respect for Alara Kalama and the tradition that he was in. He said he had long had little dust in his eyes. That is how his, my teacher, Alara Kalama, placed me, his student, on the same position as him and honored me with lofty praise. Then it occurred to me, this teaching doesn't lead to disillusionment, dispassion, cessation, peace, insight, awakening, and extinguishment. It only leads as far as rebirth in the dimension of nothingness. Realizing that this teaching was inadequate, I left disappointed. Nibhijja apakaming. So, um, uh, it only leads, and it's important to understand this particular phrase, yeah, chan ya yatana upapatiya. Yeah? Upapatiya means rebirth. Yeah? So it means rebirth in that realm. So this is what they're looking for. It's not just attaining that nice state of meditation, right? That's good. You can abide in that samadhi, very nice. But what's the goal? What are we heading for? We're going to get reborn in that realm. So the Buddha. He left home searching for what is ajatang abhutang, what is unborn and unconditioned. And this is still conditioned. So he analankaritwa, yeah? Analankaritwa. Not enough. It's not good enough. Nibija apakaming. This is the same phrase, nibija apakaming, is used for a jackal who is trying to eat a tortoise but the tortoise has gone into its shell and the jackal sniffing around trying to get an entrance but can't and eventually he gives up and goes away disappointed. So, uh, then I set out to, to discover what is skillful seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. I approached Uddhika, the son of Rama, and said to him, Reverend, I wish to lead the spiritual life in this teaching and training. Uddhika replied, uh, and everything unfolded as it was before. But the only uh, difference is that, a uh, very subtle difference, is that when the Buddha was speaking with Alara Kalama, it was in the present tense. Okay? Notice this. It was not solely by mere faith that Rama declared. Rama declared. Okay? But the teacher is Rama Putta, Rama's son. Yeah? So Rama declared that he had realized this teaching with his own insight. But Ramaputta, Uddhika Ramaputta, did not. Yeah? 
So uh, whether he, Brahmaputta means spiritual son or an actual son is a bit unclear, but it does seem clear that, that Uddhika Ramaputta himself had not actually realized uh, these states that uh, he was speaking about. So, but he spoke of the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Okay. And again, this is very consistent through here. It's not just Rama who had faith, Ahosi. Yeah? Not who has faith, Ahosi who had faith. Um, okay. Then he practiced it and said it's not good enough and then left. Uh, and the other difference, of course, is at the end, uh, instead of uh, seeking to lead the community together, in this case, Uddhika Ramaputta placed him in the sole position of leadership. Okay, moving on. So he left all that. Not good enough. Okay? Not good enough. I set out to discover what is skillful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, that traveling stage by stage in the Magadan lands. I arrived at Sena Nigama near Uruvela. There I saw a delightful park, a lovely grove with a flowing river that was clean and charming with smooth banks, and nearby it was a village to go for arms. It occurred to me, this park is truly delightful, a lovely grove with a flowing river that's clean and charming, with smooth banks, and nearby there's a village to go for arms. This is good enough for a gentleman who wishes to put forth effort in meditation. So I sat down right there thinking, this is good enough for meditation. Alamidang padhanaya. Okay? Again, like that joy and love of nature that the Buddha had is so, to me, is so charming. And, and I don't know if we really find that in the earlier scriptures, like I don't, the Jain scriptures, Brahmanical scriptures, I don't really know if we find that same love of nature. But the Buddha clearly felt, oh, this is what he loved. Yeah? He wasn't distracted by all of the fancy cities and all of, the, all of that kind of stuff. But a nice, ah, oh, lovely tree, Nice river, so beautiful, so nice to meditate. Yeah? And I think it's, it's also a nice reflection for us, you know, sometimes that when we're wanting to meditate, uh, then it's easy for us to uh, get caught up sometimes in like what, what we're going to have all the right conditions to meditate. Is it the right time? Do we have the right place? Do we have the right meditation cushion? I need my meditation timer. I need my meditation app. I need all of these kinds of things. But good enough. Yeah, a bit of shade, somewhere peaceful, eh, good enough. Alampadana, yeah. Then these three examples, which are neither supernaturally inspired nor learned before in the past, occurred to me. Suppose there was a green sappy log and it was lying in water. Along a person comes with a drill stick, thinking to light a fire and produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? By drilling the stick against that green sappy log lying in the water, could they light fire and produce heat? No, Master Gautama, why not? Because it's a green, mm. sappy log and it's lying in the water. The person will eventually get weary and frustrated. In the same way, there are ascetics and Brahmins who don't live withdrawn in body and mind from sensual pleasures. So notice we're coming back to that uh, duality of the mind and the body. Right? So here the Buddha is shifting the vocabulary a little bit, but still using the idea of the body and the mind. They haven't internally given up or still desire, affection, infatuation, thirst, and passion for sensual pleasures, regardless of whether or not they feel painful, sharp, severe, acute feelings due to overexertion. They are incapable of knowledge and vision of supreme awakening. This is the first example that occurred to me. Yeah. Second example. Suppose there was a green sappy log and it was lying on dry land, far from the water. Along comes a person with a drill stick, thinking to light a fire and produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? By drilling the stick against that green sappy log on dry land far from water, could they light a fire and produce heat? No, Master Gotama. Why not? Because it's still a green sappy log, despite the fact that it's living on dry land far from water. That person will eventually get weary and frustrated. In the same way, there are ascetics and Brahmins who live withdrawn in body and mind from sensual pleasures, but they haven't internally given up or still desire affection, infatuation, thirst, and passion for sensual pleasures. 
They, regardless of whether or not they suffer painful, sharp, severe, acute feelings due to overexertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision of supreme awakening. This is the second example that occurred to me. Then a third example occurred to me. Suppose there were a dried up, withered log and it was lying on dry land far from the water. Then a person comes along with a fire stick thinking to light fire and produce heat. What do you think, Agi Vesana, by drilling the stick against that dried up, withered log on dry land far from water, could they light a fire and produce heat? Yes, Master Gotama, why is that? Because it's a dried up withered log and it's lying on dry land far from water. In the same way, there are ascetics and Brahmins who live withdrawn in body and mind from sensual pleasures and they have internally given up and stilled affection, infatuation, thirst and passion for sensual pleasures, regardless of whether or not they suffer painful, sharp, severe, acute feelings due to overexertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision of supreme awakening. This was the third example that occurred to me. These are the three examples which are neither supernaturally inspired nor learned before in the past that occurred to me. So that what this phrase here is uh, uh, affirming is that this is a genuine insight that the Buddha came to. It's not something from a deva or a god, and it's not something that he had learned before from some other teaching. Okay, now there's a slight textual problem here because this um, teaching on, uh, on the three similes seems to be saying that there's no point in these uh, self-modification practices. Um, uh, but then he goes on to talk about how he did all these self-modification practices. So I suspect there may be an editing problem in this. I, I want to check the uh, Chinese parallels before making any seclusion. But I think perhaps I wonder whether that section on the three similes was meant to go after the next section. Yeah, just a suspicion. I could check um, Analio's essay on that. I'm sure he'd have a comment on that uh, to see how the whether the chi how the Chinese versions compare. Anyway. Then it occurred to me, why don't I, with teeth clenched and tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, squeeze, squash, and torment mind with mind? Well, that's what I did until sweat came from my armpits. Like a strong man grabs a weaker man by the head or throat or shoulder and squeezes, squashes, and tortures them. In the same way, with teeth clenched and tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I squeezed squashed and tortured mind with mind until sweat ran from my armpits. My energy was roused up and unflagging. My mindfulness was established and lucid, but my body was disturbed and not tranquil because I'd pushed too hard with that painful striving. But even such painful feeling did not occupy my mind. So notice here, he's already he's talking about mindfulness. He already mentioned mindfulness before with the, under the Brahmins. And here again, talking about establishing mindfulness, upatita sati. Yeah? So he had mindfulness. Again, mindfulness is not something the Buddha invented. But his body was not tranquil. That's the problem. Asaradho yeah? chapaname kayo. Mm. So we're going to be going over and doing some meditation in a little while. Would you like to do this one? This meditation? <laughs> Just as an experiment? No? <laughs> no? You sure? No takers? Uh, <laughs> All right. Doesn't sound... Okay. Why not... Okay, if you think that meditation was bad... Oh, dear. Then why don't I try practicing the breathless absorption, right? The apanakanyeva jhanam. So I cut off breathing through my mouth and nose. Then winds came out my ears, making a loud noise like the puffing of a blacksmith's bellows. My energy was roused up and unflagging. My mindfulness was established and lucid, but my body was still disturbed because I'd pushed too hard. Why don't I keep practicing the breathless absorption? I cut off my breathing through my mouth and nose and ears. Then strong winds ground my head like a strong man was drilling into my head with a sharp point. No? No takers? We don't want to try this one tonight? <laughs> my energy was roused up, but still, even that painful feeling did not occupy my mind. Why don't I keep doing it? I cut off my breathing through my mouth and nose and ears, but then I got a severe headache like a strong man was tightening a tough leather strap around my head. A very vivid imagery all through this passage, right? 
he's the Buddha speaking from his own experience. Then keep practicing it. I cut off my breathing. Then strong winds carved up my belly like a deaf butcher or their apprentice was slicing my belly open with a meat cleaver. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I'm reading this is that I just want you to bear this in mind, okay? The next time that you feel like complaining because you had an itch in your meditation, okay? <laughs> oh, my knee was a bit sore, all right, fine. I get it, but this is what the Buddha, the Buddha went through, okay? Uh, just to get as a um, point of history, and I might ch I'm thinking of actually changing this translation here, because the word I've translated as butcher is gogahataka, which literally means a cow slaughterer, yeah, cow slaughterer. So this is a kind of a, an interesting question in Indian history, because of course we have the notion of this sacred cow and the idea that you know, cows were never killed in ancient India. But obviously, <laughs> they were, right? I mean, you not only... It's just mentioning in passing that there was a butcher of cows and a butcher of cows apprentice, right? So this was a recognized trade with apprentices, and it's just a normal thing that you would use as a simile. Yeah? So it's more complicated than that, right? There clearly cows were being slaughtered at that time. Anyway... Keep practicing the breathless absorption. So it occurred to me, why don't I keep practicing it? Well, I could have given him some reasons why not to keep practicing it, but anyway, he wanted to keep practicing it. Then there was an intense burning in my body, like two strong men grabbing a weaker man by the arms to burn and scorch him on a pit of glowing coals. Yeah? So uh, remember we talked about the tapas, right? That inner fire, right? So here he's really feeling that fire, kayasming daho, you know, burning up, you know, the samtapeyang, samparitapeyang. Um, no, still not working. Some deity saw me and said, the ascetic Gautama is dead. Others said, he's not dead, but he's dying. Others said, he's not dead or dying. The ascetic Gautama is a perfected one, an arahant. For that is how the perfected one. Deities don't always know what's going on. So just remember this. If you're meditating, if you get a visit from the gods and they tell you what's up, just remember, they don't always know what's what, all right? So just bear it in mind. Don't be too impressed by all like the light show, all the fancy stuff, right? Don't get fooled. Then it occurred to me, why don't I practice completely cutting off food? Why not? Sounds reasonable. Deities came to me and said, good sir, don't practice totally cutting off food. If you do, we'll infuse divine nectar into your pores and you will live on that. And then I thought, well, if I claim to be completely fasting while these deities are infusing divine nectar in my pores, that would be a lie on my part. So he said, there's no need. Then it occurred to me, why don't I take just a little bit of food each time a cup of broth made from mung beans, lentils, chickpeas, or green gram? Uh, and that's what I did until my body became extremely emaciated. And so notice that this is uh, not dissimilar to the practices that we heard about before when the Buddha was talking about the... Or, well, sorry, when Satchika was talking about the uh, various ascetic practices. Due to eating so little, my limbs became like the joints of an 80-year-old or a corpse. My bottom became like a camel's hoof. My vertebrae stuck out like beads on a string, and my ribs were as gaunt as the broken-down rafters on an old barn. Due to eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank deep into its, their sockets, like the gleam of water sunk deep down a well. Due to eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered like a green bitter gourd in the wind and sun. Due to eating so little, the skin of my belly stuck to my backbone, so that when I tried to rub the skin of my belly, I grabbed my backbone, and when I tried to rub my backbone, I rubbed the skin of my belly. Due to eating so little, when I tried to urinate or defecate, I fell face down right there. Due to eating so little, when I tried to relieve my, my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots, fell out. And some people saw me and they said, the ascetic Gautama is black. Some said he's not black, he's brown. Some said he's neither black nor brown. The ascetic Gautama has tawny skin. That's how far the pure, bright complexion of my skin had been ruined by, by taking so little food. 
Then I thought, whatever ascetics and Brahmins have experienced, painful, sharp, severe, acute feelings due to overexertion, whether in the past, present, or future, this is as far as it goes. No one has done more than this. But I have not achieved any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision. Uh, uh, worthy of the noble ones by this severe, grueling work. Could there be another path to awakening? Siya nuko anyo mago bodhaya. Could there be? Siya nuko. Could there be another way? Anyo mago. Siya nuko anyo mago. So after all of this time, after all of this practice, he's still wondering could there be another way? Yeah. Do you know about the sunk cost fallacy? Do you know the sunk cost fallacy? Sunk cost fallacy, you ba basically you start something up. Oh, you know? Right, yeah. And even though there's a time to say no and <laughs> just lose it. And so this, this sunk cost fallacy happens a lot in spiritual practice. Yeah. People put a lot of time and effort into their spiritual practice. They invest a lot in it. And sometimes it's hard to say, yeah, actually, that was a waste of time. Maybe I need to do something else. Yeah? So again, this is that kind of act of courage of the Buddha. He's been through all of that, put through all of that effort, and then to say, no, actually, this is not actually getting anywhere. Sihanu ko anyomago bodhai. Then it occurred to me, I recall, sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree while my father, the Sakyan, was off working, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, I entered and remained in the first absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion, while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Could that be the path to awakening? Stemming from that memory came the realization that is the path to awakening. And it occurred to me, why am I afraid of that pleasure? For it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures or unskillful qualities. And I thought, it's not a I'm not afraid of that pleasure, for it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures or, unfil or unskillful qualities. Then I thought, I can't achieve that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. Why don't I eat some solid food, some rice and porridge, so I ate some solid food. All right, so this is this crucial turning point in the Buddha's life story, okay? This is where he is now uh, coming back to his own insight. Siya nuko anyomago. Not relying on what the Brahmins taught him, not relying on what the Jains taught him, but looking at his own life and his own experience, okay? This is the moment, this is Luke Skywalker on that last run at the Death Star, when he sets aside his viewfinder and he relies on the force. Yes? Yes, you know. You've all seen Star Wars, most of you. All right? This is that moment. He's going to rely on his own intuition. Yeah? That's this crucial moment. It's such a small moment right? in this whole story. All these things have happened. It's such a small moment. Maybe there could be another way. But that small moment changed everything. And look at how that feel of how the meditation is talked about here in the Buddhist context compared to the previous context in the Jainism. Yeah? I recall sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree yeah? and then going in secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities. I entered and remained in the first absorption which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion. That so the emphasis on peacefulness, calm, bliss, and pleasure. I can't experience that pleasure. I don't have to be afraid of it. I can't experience that pleasure unless my body is healthy. Yeah? Such a different feeling to the whole meditation. So much more gentle. Yeah? So much more peaceful feeling to the meditation. Yeah? So let me ask the same question again. Who wants to go and do this meditation tonight? Yes? Okay? Okay, much more enthusiasm for that one. We're not going to do the crushing mind with mind thing, no? We're going to do this one. Okay, great. Excellent. Because I wouldn't know how to do the crushing mind with mind thing anyway, but uh, so that's good. Um, 
And so this, that crucial moment, that practice of jhana is the, the turning point towards uh, Nibbāna. And the, uh, this, this line here is very specific, a very particular uh, phrasing, uh, quite an unusual phrasing. Satanu sari vinyanang ahosi. So satanu sari, following along from that memory. Sata is the memory. Anusari vinyanang ahosi. So it's this description of that insight that's just coming to you. Yeah? He's not just, like previously when he talks about, normally when it says, talks about something, it'll just say etad ahosi. Oh, this occurred to me. Or then I thought this. Yeah? It's just ordinary phrase. But this is not using that. Yeah? He's not saying just, oh, I thought this, right? Satana sorry, following along from that memory, this, this wisdom, this realization, this vinyana arose. Yeah? In, 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 speaking of an intuitive insight. Uh, so we're all familiar with this story of the Buddha sitting under the, the rose apple tree. Uh, I won't talk about it again in too much detail, um, but only to point out that... Um, the characteristic of this. Notice, notice, how the, notice how the characteristic of this matches the characteristic of where the Buddha saw the, the cool river in Uruvela yeah, and Bodhgaya and went and sat down there. Yeah, a beautiful place in nature where we can go and sit and be peaceful. Yeah? This is something that's really important for meditation. Yeah? It's not necessarily a meditation method or something like that, but to have that environment, ah, then that naturally leads on to the peace of the mind in meditation. Yeah? The Buddha's not talking here about details of meditation techniques and all of those kinds of things. He just sat there peacefully and went into deep meditation. Why is it that we have all of these meditation things now? Why is it that we can listen to a thousand talks on YouTube? We can download a thousand meditation apps we can have the perfect meditation cushion. We can have everything we want, and yet we still can't find peace. Yeah? Anyway, so he thought, I'll eat some solid food. Now, at that time, the five mendicants were attending on me, thinking the ascetic Gautama will tell us of any truth that he realizes, but when I ate some solid food, they left disappointed. Uh, again, the same phrase, Nibidja Pakamingsu. Uh, saying the ascetic Gotama has become indulgent, mahuliko. He has strayed from the struggle, padhana vibhanto. Avato bahulaya has returned to indulgence. After eating solid food and gathering my strength, quite so. So, so notice how here, um, by, by talking about gathering his strength here, the Buddha is. Uh, is incorporating that aspect of kaya bhavana, which was in Satchika's original question. Yeah? So chitta bhavana and the kaya bhavana is there. So the kaya bhavana is not the self-torment, but is simply having a healthy and strong body. Yeah? Then he ate the food, went into first jhana, but even that pleasant feeling did not occupy his mind. Then second jhana, I won't go through the jhanas in detail because we will talk about these things later on. So the different jhanas, but none of those things he got attached to, right? Then he uh, extended, recollect, developed the, the te vidya, the recollection of past lives, and the uh, uh, dibha sota, the, sorry, dibha chaku, the uh, clair, power of clairvoyance, uh, to... Uh, understand how beings are reborn according to their deeds and then um, finally to the realization of the four noble truths yeah? so these are the te vidya the three knowledges and the te vidya in buddhism of course replace the three vedas of the brahman um, and just a technical note here. Uh, notice here at the end how the Buddha describes his realization of the Dhamma with two paragraphs. The first paragraph, idang dukkanti yatabhutang abhanyasing, I, I understood this is suffering and origin and the ending of suffering. This is the familiar form of the Four Noble Truths. In the second paragraph, ime asavati yatabhutang abhanyasing, 
these are defilements, these are asavas. Yeah? And the origin, the cessation, and the path leading to the cessation. Now this is, these, when we find these two phrasings together, this is a shorthand. Idang okay? dukkang is the realization of stream entry. The vision of the Four Noble Truths at stream entry, the initial vision of the Four Noble Truths. Ime asava is arahantship. Okay, and this is the ending of all of the defilements. So these two phrasings are used in this way throughout the suttas. Knowing and seeing like this, my mind was freed from the defilements of sensuality, desire to be reborn, and ignorance. Yeah. When it was freed, I knew it was freed. I understood. Rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. Wusitang Brahmacharya. Yeah, the purpose that he set out. What had to be done has been done. Katang Karaniyang. There is no return to any state of existence. Naparang Ithatayati. This was the third knowledge which I achieved in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was destroyed and knowledge arose. Darkness was destroyed and light arose. This happens for a meditator who is diligent, keen, and resolute. But even such pleasant feeling did not occupy my mind. Agivesana, so this is the main ending of the sutta, huh? and this is the teaching on the, uh, 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 the, the practice of jhanas and the threefold knowledges. We will return to these later on in the course. Agivesana, I recall teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of many hundreds, and each person thinks that I'm teaching the Dhamma especially for them. But it should not be seen like this. The realized one teaches others only so that they can understand. When that talk is finished, I still settle, unify, and immerse my mind in samadhi internally using the same medita meditation subject as a foundation of immersion that I used before, which is my usual meditation. So it's an interesting little addendum that the Buddha puts on his teaching here, right? So it's not entirely clear why he mentions this here, but it's still it's an interesting observation. Uh, he's teaching to many people, and everybody thinks he's teaching for them. Right? And I've, I've also had this, this, um, uh, uh, this thing happen to me in, in Dhamma talks. Right? You're giving a Dhamma talk, and then somebody comes up to you afterwards and says, how did you know? Oh my goodness, you must be reading my mind. And I'm like, I'm just teaching Dhamma. <laughs> and they say, but you spoke about those things. That's, that's like exactly what's happening in my life. I'm like, yes, that's what I try to do as a Dhamma teacher, is talk a way that's going to connect with people's lives. And people think, oh, yes, it's talking to me. Huh? Sometimes people get afraid of that, right? So I'll, I'll say, like, oh, oh, some people are attached to this or attached to that, and people are sitting there thinking, oh, no, he means me. He's talking about me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... But the Buddha is saying, I'm not teaching. So I'm only teaching so you can understand. Yavadeva vinyapanataya, for the sake of sharing knowledge, sharing understanding. Yeah? And then when he's finished, so the Buddha is not concerned. He doesn't get caught up with all of the, the drama and everything when they're teaching and the projections. Like, like this, this is a really in, important teaching, actually, for, for meditation teachers. Okay? So for those of us who are Sangha, uh, for those of us who, a uh, number of us who are meditation teachers as well, just to remember this. This is the motivation that the Buddha gave. Yeah? Not getting caught up in favoring and opposing and this person and that person, but just so that you can share that knowledge and share that understanding. Yeah? And afterwards, then you come back to meditation. Yeah? You come back to that same state of meditation that you were in before. Yeah? Uh, and again, I mentioned before that the use of the word samadhi nimitta in the suttas. Yeah? So we find that same word again here. So the same puras being samadhi nimitte. Yeah? So it doesn't mean, again, an image in samadhi. It means the same meditation, which is yena sudang nichika pang viharami, my usual meditation, which uh, was um, traditionally said to be anapanasati, was the Buddha's normal meditation. So really wonderful piece of advice and really good to bear in mind for anyone who's doing Dhamma teaching. Yeah? When we're teaching, don't get caught up, oh, this is for me or the, you or this person or that person. We only teach to share understanding and afterwards come back, come back to mindfulness and meditation. 
I believe that of Master Gautama, just like a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha, says Satchika. But, he says, still hoping to get something after all of that, right? Do you ever recall sleeping during the day? Again, like, this is like so classic, right? This is like exactly the kind of thing that people will do. They hear this whole thing, right? All of this, which would be, why, goodness, all of that stuff we just heard. Well, yeah, but I'm still going to get you, right? I'm still, you're sleeping in the day, yeah? This is slacker. And <laughs> the Buddha said, oh, I do recall in the last month of the summer, I have spread out my outer robe folded in four and laid down in the lion's posture on the right side, placing one foot on top of the other, mindful and aware. All right? So the Buddha did sometimes have a little nap in the daytime. Some ascetics and Brahmins, <laughs> A.K. Samana Brahmana, so notice how uh, Satchika's phrasing it. It's not me, right? I wouldn't say that. But some Samanas and Brahmanas say, call this a deluded abiding, uh, some mohavihārasmi. That's not how to define whether someone is deluded or not. But as to how to define whether someone is deluded or not, pay attention and I will speak. The Buddha said this, whoever has not given up the defilements that lead to future lives and a hurtful resulting in suffering and future rebirth, old age and death is deluded. For it's not giving up the defilements, for it's not giving up the defilements that makes you deluded. Whoever has given up the defilements is not deluded, for it's giving up the defilements that makes you not deluded. The realized one has given up the defilements, corruptions that lead to future lives and are hurtful. Leading, resulting in suffering and future rebirth, old age and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, obliterated them so that they are un, in, un, unable to arise in the future. Just as a palm tree with its crown cut off is incapable of future growth, in the same way the realized one has given up the defilements so they are unable to arise in the future. When he had spoken, Satchika said to him, it's incredible, Master Gotama, it's amazing. When Master Gautama is repeatedly attacked with inappropriate and intrusive criticism, the complexion of his skin brightens and the color of his face becomes clear, just like a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha. I recall taking on Purana Kasapa in debate, another one of the leaders of the Samanas. He dodged the issue, distra distracting the discussion with irrelevant points and displaying annoyance, hate and bitterness. But when Master Gotama has repeatedly attacked with inappropriate and in intrusive criticism, the complexion of his skin brightens and the color of his face becomes clear, just like the perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha. So it must be really frustrating if you're trying to attract or criticize one, and the more you do it, then the more they just become calm and serene. Yes. That's his confidence, right? Yeah. Well, he was, he was, this was Satchika's character, right? He was kind of wandering around, having a go at all of these ascetics, yeah. He was, he was looking for, he was, he was basically a troll, you know, a pre-internet troll. He's going asking these questions, trying to get a rise out of him. You know, you can see these kind of pointed questions. He wasn't, you know, he was, he's kind of in between. He's kind of seeking for knowledge, but also kind of trying to have a go at people. And, uh... But, yeah, it went to all of these other teachers, Makali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kambala, Pakudekatayana, Sanjaya Bilaki Putta, and Nigantanata Putta. This is the classic list of the six uh, ascetic leaders. They all dodged the issue, distracting the discussion. But um, uh, Master Gotama had uh, just got more clear and peaceful. Then he said, well, now, Master Gotama, I must go. I have many duties and much to do. <laughs> Please, Agivesana, go at your convenience. Then Satchika, the son of Jane Parents, having approved and agreed with what the Buddha said, got up from his seat and left. So it's a bit, uh, bit abrupt. So he doesn't, he still, after all that, still doesn't become converted. Yeah, still not convinced. Did he eventually become converted and convinced? I will leave that to you to find out, okay? You can do some research. There are more suttas with Satchika. You can find that out for yourself. Yes? Mm, uh, no, Aggi, on the edge. Why would it be the edge? Oh, the peak. Yeah. Aggi is the fire, yeah? Agi Vesana is, I think, means the servant of the fire. Yeah, so it's a Brahmanical family name. 
at the peak. Yeah, so that would be aga rather than agi. Yeah, agi vesana I think means the servant of the flame. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right, good point, yes. So according to uh, many of the traditional recountings of that, the Buddha snuck out in the middle of the night like a naughty teenager. Uh, but according to this one, yes, his parents were weeping and wailing as he left. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, well spotted, well observed, yeah. Yes, Nimishi. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, what can you say? Um, uh, it's, it's kind of out there. Yeah? It's very hard, you know, you're well beyond the realm of thought, well, well beyond the realm of anything that we've experienced. And there's no, you know, even, you know, not to speak of like the senses and all of those experiences, but even like the meditation, like the, the light in meditation of these things is all gone. And um, there's no kind of limits on the mind. So the mind is like, again, this is, is it actually is very like, uh, as an experience, you can, you know, it's quite similar to that, again, that Brahmanical idea of being the self, being the same as the cosmos, yeah? So you're infinite like the whole universe is, yeah? And, uh, but yeah, it's an incredibly stable state of mind and one which, like it talks about being reborn in that realm. So according to the suttas, to be reborn in the realm of nothingness uh, is 60,000 eons. So that means 60,000 times the world, the universe, Big bang to a big crunch, 60,000 times. You're just. Yeah. It is, yes. Yeah, so the formless attainments build on the jhanas. Yeah. Notice how in that teaching, uh, first of all, he says that Lara Kalama had faith, energy, mindfulness, samadhi, wisdom. Yeah, so samadhi is the jhanas. So that was already assumed beforehand. Yeah.